Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Are you comfortable, Cameron? Yes, thanks. Have you seen the flat? Yes. And you like it? Yes, it's great. What on earth could make you think we'd want to share a flat like this with someone like you? <laughs> Must be Hugo. And you must be Juliet. Can you open your door? It's us, your flatmates and companions, your newfound friends. I've never seen a dead body before. I saw my grandmother, of course, but I don't suppose that counts. I mean, she was alive at the time. It's not every day I find a story in my own flat. It's not a story, Alex, it's a corpse. Can I show you something? It's a sick idea, Alex, it's sick. Well, go ahead then, telephone the police. Tell them there's a suitcase full of money and you don't want it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's talk about disposal. Who's going to do it? We all are, David. We're all going to do it. Each of us, you, me and Juliet. I don't think I can. But Juliet, you're a doctor. You kill people every day. Is this necessary? I can't do it. Do you want to play or not? I know you well enough. Oh, you think so? We don't know how much it cost us yet. Let's spend some money. For you two to have a good time, we don't know the cost of that yet. You're fighting. I'm not fighting. Yeah. I'm a little terrified, maybe. <laughs> they went there alive and they came back down dead. Did you notice that? The difference, I mean, alive, dead, dead, alive, that sort of thing. It wasn't difficult to spot. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Rob St. Mary. Joining me, of course, Mr. Mike White. I'll just be up in the attic if anyone needs me. And back with us this week, our good friend, Jeff Myers. Hey, how's it going? And um, I'm so glad to have friends like you. Well, you know, it's all about friendship this week, as our Noir Vember concludes with a little murder among friends. It's Danny Boyle's debut feature, Shallow Grave. Film stars Ewan McGregor as Alex, Christopher Eccleston as David, and Carrie Fox as Juliet, three flatmates, who uh, welcome in a mysterious new roommate, Hugo. And uh, when Hugo dies, leaves behind a suitcase full of money, and the question is what to do with it, and then um, what do you do with the body? The trio soon starts to ask, um, you know, will you cut the feet off the dead guy and bury the body in this uh, shallow grave as a test of their friendship and, I think, in a way, maybe their own sanity. Uh, Of course, we'll get into some spoilers on this episode, so if you haven't seen Shallow Grave, do go check it out and come back, as we'll be waiting for you. And as always, starting off with our guest co-host, Mr. Jeff Myers, when was the first time you saw Shallow Grave and what did you think? Oh, you know, I was I, I was really thinking about this. I like I I don't know what theater I saw it in. I know I saw it while I was living in Portland, Oregon. Um, was such a great year. Actually, like ninety four through ninety eight were great years for crime, kind of twisted crime do- dramas and noirs. And when I look like at ninety five, the reason Shallow Grave, like I I can't remember pinpoint the exact where I saw it is because that, that was the year Usual Suspects opened and seven and steven soderbergh's the underneath which is one of those kind of obscure movies that i i loved and heat and so there were all these like amazing kind of dark hued crime dramas that were coming out at that time um but i remember the thing that i loved about shallow grave when i first saw it was just how bleak (laughs) how how bleak it was and yet how incredibly energetic it had been uh, directed uh, by Danny Boyle. Uh, just, like those two things um, working together were really unique. As for you, Mr. Mike, I remember distinctly seeing this. Uh, I went up to Toronto. First time I was in Toronto was February of 1995, and there's no better time to go to Toronto than when it's February. Uh, I found out that out the hard way. Uh, Wow, you fell off your chair from that one? <laughs> it is so amazing. <laughs> 
And I went to see it at the Eaton Center. Uh, people who are fans of uh, the Silent Partner will remember the Eaton Center being featured in there. And they had a theater all the way down in the basement, if memory serves. And I went in there, and it was totally packed. And it made sense that it was packed because it felt like there were only about 20 seats in this theater. And the TV – or sorry, the screen was no bigger than my television set, it felt like. It was very, very tiny, very crowded, but it was a great experience, really warm as well, just because of all the bodies packed in there. And this film made quite an impression. I actually didn't revisit it until last week, uh, just because it had been so uh, ingrained on my memory, just because it made such a great impact. And seeing Chris Freckleson and especially Ewan McGregor, that was really, I think, my first experience with those guys and knocked my socks off. I was just so amazed at their performances and I was so glad to see them when they started showing up in other things. As for me, I don't believe I saw this until I saw it on VHS after Trainspotting came out. And um, I saw Trainspotting and I said, hmm, what about this Danny Boyle guy? So went and picked that up and who's this Ewan McGregor guy so and was introduced to it and also the fact that and I've talked about this before my mother being from Scotland I have an affinity for trying to pick up Scottish film when I can because uh, it seems that maybe you might get one or two every couple of years that comes out over here and I would just sort of uh, latch on to it because I just always wanted to see what they were doing back in the old country. So uh, I really liked it. I thought it was uh, rather funny um, and also rather bleak at the same time as you were saying, Jeff. Yeah, I think it's amazing how it's a film where everybody's a douchebag. <laughs> I mean, I think and that, I think that was something I had not encountered before. I also like what Mike, Mike said, like this idea that once he saw it, it, it stuck with him until he rewatched it. Me rewatching it last week, it was amazing to me how, and I don't think I had seen it since I first saw it in, in 1995, how much I knew every beat. Like, the movie clearly had made such an impression that 20 years later, I had not forgotten anything. Like, it wasn't one of those, oh, yeah, I forgot about that moment. Instead, it was, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. Oh, yeah, that was good, you know. It, it's it's kind of remarkable how how indelible it is. I mean, definitely for me as well. There were certain scenes and even certain lines of dialogue that I still remembered, and I have probably haven't seen it in over ten years. When I saw the movie, I kind of flipped out because of the guy that plays Hugo, who's played by Keith Allen, and. Looking up Keith Allen, he has been in a ton of stuff, and he's directed a bunch of stuff. He's been involved with music and has musical kids and all this stuff. But what I knew him from was this was 95 when I saw it. In 94, I was working at Comcast Cable as a cons commercial insertion uh, person, which sounds kind of dirty, but it really wasn't. <laughs> and there was a series of ESPN, I think, commercials all about the World Cup because that's when the World Cup was coming to the U.S. And Keith Allen was the spokesperson. And they were just these amazing commercials where he was trying to explain to Americans the importance of soccer to everyone else in the world. And they probably had like seven or eight spots and they were just terrific. Just the editing was great. He was amazing. His level of energy and everything. And he was the one who kind of, you know, turned me on to the whole idea of, you know, uh, Valderrama down in Brazil and this guy with this amazing head of hair and everything and so to see him show up in uh, in Shallow Grave I was just so excited to see him and then of course he's only on screen for like five minutes before he's dead but it was still great. So starting off at the top we get this face and close up and the angle kind of changes and there's a voiceover about trust and friendship and life. Very reminiscent of Sunset Boulevard eh? The voice of the guy who didn't make it um, <laughs> telling us about the value of friendship in a movie where friendship means nothing, <laughs> um, which is one of the things I love about the film. You know, it was interesting watching it this time. And even though I knew every beat of the movie, what I think makes the movie work is really, I mean, yes, John Hodges' script is witty, but Boyle's direction elevates this, I think, a bit above what it might have otherwise been, mainly because it's, it's a movie where there's like nothing at stake. 
it doesn't matter where the money winds up or which roommate gets it because you can't really root for any of them because they're just so awful. And none of them demonstrates, you know, a whole lot of integrity at any point. And even when Hugo dies, spoiler alert, uh, like so quickly, his death doesn't even affect or matter to the roommates. It becomes a matter of inconvenience and opportunity and nothing else. There's like literally no moral component to the way of their thinking. And that's, um, which is a pretty nihilistic way of looking at the world, especially when the whole movie starts off with, oh, yes, I believe in friends, um, which becomes this kind of highly er ironic statement. Well, the thing I find interesting is these are not down on their luck folks. These are professionals. She's a doctor. He's an accountant. And Ewan McGregor's character is a reporter. So all three of them are professionals in the society. And they all happen to be completely detached from one another, even though they live together. The whole thing that starts us off, too, after that is this whole idea of this search for a new flatmate. And, yeah, you're right. They're not strapped for cash. And they use that. Uh, that audition process just as this way to take the piss out of so many people and just that scene of them interviewing all these different folks is just oh man that just sets up so many great things throughout the film and you just immediately know what Pratt's these three are and at first I'm thinking okay well maybe Eccleson is not part of this and maybe it's just you know the uh, Juliet and Alex the the Carrie Fox and Ian McGregor characters but no then at one point David is there just doing the exact same thing and just really putting the screws on to people and it's just like oh man it was it, it was great that I, I forgot that Seinfeld had come out in like 89 and this really feels like it kind of picked up from Seinfeld as far as nobody in Seinfeld is a really likable character either and these three are just completely despicable and I really appreciate that about this film yeah I, I think also it does something that was part of the trend of films of that time which was this kind of reinterpretation of the noir you know you have the, the whole idea of noirs are that you have characters who are doomed to face judgment for their misdeeds, right? They, you know, they, 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 they make a, a fatal choice, usually for greed or lust or whatever it is, and it ends up undoing them. And there's always, in the past, there was always kind of a component of sentimentality mixed in there in kind of early noirs. And what was going on in, like, the 90s with this kind of neo-noir movement was this like this subtraction of sentimentality there there was no more romanticism about it there was no more self-pity instead it was really these lots of ghoulish kind of characters who seem incapable of empathy basically screwing each other over <laughs> I like that there are these three people, the woman and the two men, and you would think in a normal film, quote-unquote, there would be this romantic triangle, and that would really matter. And you know throughout the film that it's just, yeah, she sleeps with one, she sleeps with the other, and she's basically looking to find out how she's going to get the better deal and play them off of each other. And everybody's playing everybody off of one another. They're all equally despicable. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> also that whole thing in the beginning, I, I think is kind of genius. And I realized it watching it again uh, in terms of a structure. I mean, Hodge as a writer and Boyle as a director starts it off where they're, they're mean and they're nasty, but to a certain extent we're with them in that scene and we're having fun with it. It's actually kind of humorous in a way until we see sort of, uh, how it's not so funny later with the payoff with Cameron, the one guy. So to me, they're getting they're getting you in on the ground floor rather quick with the psychology of these characters that they are brutal underneath. But it's this is a light brutality. This is um, you know just kind of a parlor game that maybe you would play with your friends or something for entertainment. It almost seems like this for them is better than television. Yeah, there. It, I mean, there's that nasty wit that's part of Hodge's writing, you know, and he has some great lines. Um, I love the, 
<laughs> when Ewan McGregor's character says, But Julia, you're a doctor. You kill people every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great line. Um, or when he says, you know, it's important to me to die misunderstood, um, which, you know, is also a great kind of telegraphing of the end of the film. But um, I think that really, uh, I, I do think that, I don't know that I'm in with them like you were, Rob. I I. I think they're pretty despicable all the way through and i didn't ever find myself rooting for them but boyle gives the whole film kind of this energy and pace and kinetic you know verve that just kind of sweeps you along and even if you're not siding with them you are definitely kind of pulled into the wash of what they're doing i think the only way that hugo manages to take that spot in the flat is because he gets Carrie Fox alone and is able to have more of a human conversation with her rather than facing the three of them. And I love the way that they're shot in kind of that tribunal, you know, form where they have the other person, you know, alone on that couch across from them. But he has this much more of a human interaction with her. And then the other two don't necessarily ever connect with Hugo whatsoever. And he is the perfect mysterious roommate where yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. I read a uh, review of the film, and they were saying that he was an annoying roommate, and I didn't find him annoying at all. Oh. I, I thought that he was the perfect flatmate because he comes and goes, and nobody knows anything about this guy. I think also that he was a mystery. I mean, you know, the thing you got from them was that they were so isolated and kind of – I mean, you do get the feeling that they're a little miserable as people, even though they seem so self-satisfied, and yet – he actually brought an element of mystery to them. And I don't know that the guys wouldn't have been on board because I think he exuded a kind of cool and a lack of neuroses that they didn't have. So it became kind of not only do, are they inviting in the mysterious roommate, they're inviting in the roommate who might potentially be cooler than they are. Yeah, when they're asking him if they've if he's ever killed anyone and he just, you know, kind of smiles a little bit and goes along with their stupid questions, but he is the guy who has killed someone before. And I love that cut to the ATM that we have in that <laughs> that series of that little scene that's playing out while they're quizzing him about things. And he just just rolls with the punches and he yeah, he's so much cooler than they are and so just like what a bunch of jerks but this is a place for me to hide out and just kind of takes the piss out of uh, Alex a little bit which I really appreciated because he just won't put up with it interesting really yes well that's what she said interesting you see that's why you're here normally I don't usually meet people unless they already know them I see people can be so cruel so um <clears throat> Well, uh, we think it's fine. Ah, so I can have the room. Yes, you can have the room. Oh, I'm not usually drunk. Not usually this drunk. Only on expenses. That's no, true. A newspaper's paying for all this. All this. A someone newspaper. Someone it was you, Julia. It, it was is, you. What I am, which is a hack. The man we know. Miserable, love. tired, out, empty shell of a known love. Yeah. I think you're lying. You're right. You see, they don't really know me. No, Alex. We don't really love you. The other thing that I like about him in here is that once he dies, we would think, okay, well now the plot's going to be, let's find out about this guy. We don't, <laughs> we don't learn anything about him, anything more than when he was alive. And we don't even really know much about the two guys who come to figure out where he ate, what the hell happened to him. The only thing that I think maybe we're led to infer is that, Maybe it was some sort of robbery or something, because how do you get that much money? I think we don't know much about any of the characters. <laughs> I mean, even even the three leads, even Carrie Fox, Christopher Eccleston, and Ewan McGregor's characters, they're, a bit of, they're, they're pretty cagey. You don't know much about them. You only know them in the context of this story. And I actually think there's a joke that's been kind of written into the film, how they all seem to have this inability to answer the phone. Right. Um, and it's a running joke that goes on. But I think part of it is because they don't really have an existence outside what we see. 
And the phone is kind of this connection outside that, and they kind of deny that to us. Yeah, even when it comes to the inspector who shows up eventually, we don't get now the film turns into Inspector McCall's film, and we go back to the police station with him, and he's, you know, doing the investigation none of that he is just this figure who will show up occasionally and really spook these characters and i love the interaction that he has with his kind of protege especially when uh he's clearing up uh how many people live in the flat and (laughs) and it was it uh it was eccleson right who's just like no there's only three people that live here you know you, you have to write three and the other three people living in the flat did they hear anything There are only two other people in the flat. Two? Who said there were four? We understood there were four people living here. Not always, of course, but no. Four? No, three. Who said there were four? How strange. And how unsatisfactory to have misleading information. Only three people here. You're sure? Yes, absolutely. Who said there were four? Make a note of that, Mitchell. Only three rather than four. Write it down. You can use numbers or words. I have no preference. And the guy <laughs> writes it as the number three and as the English word three. Right. Yeah. Who um, the the of protege? Course. The protege is played by the screenwriter John Hodge. By the way, that's what I was going to say. So yes, um, and I love that there's a whole little Laurel and Hardy routine between them. That's kind of you know this very dry. You you keep thinking they know more than they do, but they're just good at acting like they know more than they do, and it has no impact really on the plot. Um, I also think just from a production standpoint, I was reading that they literally shot all the police interrogation scenes on the last day of shooting because they were running out of budget and they just had to rush through it. And they said they they, they set it with the furniture that they did because they had actually already sold off some of the furniture in the flat. To keep the keep the production going, which I thought was really amusing, especially given that that year it ended up being the most commercially successful British film of 1995. I never would have figured this out, but I just wanted to throw this out there. Uh, I didn't realize that the inspector was one of the main dwarfs from the Hobbit films that just came out. He was like basically the uh, the the most wise one of all the uh, dwarves that Bilbo was dealing with and I was just like wow underneath all that hair and makeup I I guess I would recognize that actor but barely yeah I think it just shows how completely interchangeable the dwarves were and how he's still a good actor yeah <laughs> so after Hugo is dead and they find the suitcase full of money what to do and they debate in terms of how they're going to to go about this and I, I like this around the table that they have where Ewan McGregor is all about it and Carrie Fox seems all about it Juliet and then David character played by Christopher, Eccles- Christopher Eccleston is um, kind of like eh, I don't know in all this and it, it's just interesting to see how their alliances shift throughout the film and I mean, obviously, for each of them, they are uh, their own interest is the chief interest. But it's interesting to see how they play off each other to get the other ones to go along with them, like like peer pressure kids on a schoolyard or something. I love how Eccleston. I mean, he is you know being a chartered accountant, and I know it's a man's life being a chartered accountant and everything, but he is so timid in those early scenes and just to see his transformation he is the most dynamic character of all of these characters in the film and to watch him metamorphize into what he eventually becomes is just remarkable especially yeah in those early scenes where he's just like yeah i'm not really sure this isn't right and it goes completely the other way but i think you get a hint of that in the little opening where they're questioning the roommates where like you had said, you were fooled that David was the was the one who didn't play along, and then you see that he's just as cruel as the others. Um, I think he's just the late bloomer, so to speak. You know, I don't think he actually changes. I think he reveals who he is. He just reveals himself in a slower pace, um, and then reveals it that under all the mannerisms of being the chartered accountant is a guy who is a little bit um, 
not somebody you want to mess with. <laughs> um, no, you're uh, right. You're right. I mean, that scene, you know, you mentioned the the thing at the beginning, but yeah, when he goes off on that guy who's trying to pick up Juliet, I, yeah, I forgot about that scene. And yeah, he just completely shuts that guy down, like more than he really needed to. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting about that scene too, is it really reminds you that you're in Scotland. Like you have this kind of yuppie lifestyle that's being depicted. And then, then they go to this event where they're clearly the new generation and you see the old generation all in their tartan kilts and, you know, and they're, and they're definitely, um, they're definitely not of the same world that these young people are, which I thought was just a nice touch in showing us kind of the social world that these characters operate in. They are young professionals who are coming up behind their parents. And and this is kind of this post-Thatcherite time period where I think, you know, Boyle is ta- commenting a bit on this idea of selfishness and greed and that, you know, nobody's connected to anybody and that at the end of the day, you take care of yourself and screw everybody else. So you're saying this is what happens when you grow up under Thatcher? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A little bit. Hey, can we talk about what I consider the fourth character in the movie, which is the apartment? Sure. Which I love. I mean, I know uh, Boyle had had the whole apartment created in a soundstage, and he actually he built it up on an elevated foundation so that it would allow for him to have more interesting shots and to even create an effect where – They could use the windows to get kind of outside action. But the thing that strikes me about this set is, I mean, first of all, it's a flat like you've never seen before. I mean, it's gigantic. And then second, just even the color schemes, like if you look at any wall in that in that apartment, it looks like the cover of a 19, a cool 1970s album, you know, and you even have like William Blake paintings on the wall like you and McGregor's room is this dark, dark, dark blue. The living room is this vibrant yellow. Even the staircase up to their flat, which was obviously not part of the set, it was another location. You know, it has this look of looking like an abyss that you're climbing down into or some kind of moral black hole. I was just struck by how much the set becomes a character in the movie and how much the DP, uh, the cinematographer, uh, Brian Tafano exploits that with these slow tracking shots that not only reveal sounds and looks, but it, it gives you a feel that this place is, you know, is is just is kind of a moral battleground, so to speak. Or I wouldn't say moral. Um, it's just going to be a battleground of greed there. Well, this film really is hitting on all cylinders for me. I mean, you talked about the set and the color scheme and everything, and then cutting to some of the things that weren't on that set. When we get those interruptions, you know, I talked about the cash machine and the way that that interrupts the flow and gives us some more about Hugo and the kind of world that he's coming from and everything. And then when we get that weird interrupt of that man's face in the sea of red. And we're not sure exactly what's going on with that at first. And then finally figure out that he's being you know, tortured in this bathroom. And I just love the way that we go from that very pristine world that they're living in to these other scenes and the way that the film is paced to show us these two guys. Yeah. We never really necessarily get any kind of bead on them. They just seem to be these relentless bloodhounds tracking where's the money. You know, they're almost like uh, uh, um, Lee Marvin in point blank or something. They're just (laughs) there for the money. And we get that scene in the bathroom with the guy in the tub. And then we get the scene with the freezer with the, uh, them putting the, those weights onto the lid and the lid is see-through, which is amazing to see underneath the, the lid of that. And then the, um, the car in the quarry and them throwing that stone in there and just standing on top of that quarry. And you're just like, they're coming, they're coming. You know, they just seem like they're, you know, constantly moving closer and closer and closer to the action. And you know, when these two stories intersect that it is just going to be carnage. And when it finally does happen, 
I know it's a dummy that gets thrown from the loft down onto the floor, but it is so effective that <laughs> dead body falling out and just the, and the torture, the, the way that uh, Ewan McGregor and, and Carrie Fox are kind of incapacitated at that moment. There is, again, they're just completely relentless. They just want the money. They will do anything it takes. And you know that their lives, uh, Alex and, and Juliet, mean nothing to these two guys. What I especially like also is that Hodge never bothers to give us context. We don't know who they are. We don't know whether they work for themselves. We have no idea where the money came from. We have no idea how they even get the information that they get. We have no idea how they find the apartment. Um, what I love is that they are just they are just a shark. <laughs> you know, like you said, they're relentless. They're jaws. But what I also like is if the if the apartment is this kind of battleground for the roommates, it seems like most of what goes on outside is a little hellish. Not only do you have the thugs that are pursuing them, but you have when they true, you know, when they decide to dispose of um, Hugo Hugo's body. Thank you. Just you have that amazing scene that is completely bathed in red. With they must have used a ton of smoke machines because <laughs> the fog is just billowing in. Everything's red and. And there he is sawing away at Hugo's body and and the sound, the sound design alone of the hacksaw rasping against Hugo's ankle bones and wrist bones is, is just is just amazing. And I think that Boyle is great at creating this idea that the horror of, you know, it's kind of a chamber horror. Everything happens in this little space, and then everything outside of it is even somewhat worse. So there's almost no safe place to be. I was really reminded as they were burying Hugo in the titular shallow grave, I was really reminded of when uh, Henry and Tommy and um, Robert De Niro's character, but when they go upstate New York and they're digging out uh, Billy Bats and just that great backlit and all the red that's coming from that. I mean, it, it really reminded me of that scene just because of all the red that's happening. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was kind of a, a little director's nod there, but it was just, uh, yeah, both scenes, both uh, in Goodfellas and especially in Shallow Grave, just gorgeous, gorgeous shots. Yeah. There's a real um, aesthetic sense that's going on throughout the movie. I mean, even when they find Hugo's body, um, I know, Mike, I had sent you the image um, that I think they were basing it off of, which was uh, this, this, this painting that had been done. Uh, it, it is like this pre-Raphaelite painting. Uh, um, I'm, I'm the name of the, the, the poet that died uh, is leaving my head right now. But it, it's this painting you can see at the Tate Gallery, and they kind of arranged his body in the same way uh, it's called the death of Chatterton. That's it. And, right. uh, and it's this, this painting that um, where, you know, Chatterton, the, the poet is laying on his bed with his limbs sprawled out on this, this, you know, colorful blanket. And I think it's like Royal blue and you have Hugo kind of almost in the same position. And then there are other images that are just like so effective, even just down to Eccleston's head popping out of that little, trap door opening in the ceiling who looks like some bizarre monkey or something <laughs> hanging down, you know? Um, and even, you know, down to the, the spiral staircase down in their place, everything has this kind of um, aesthetic beauty to it. Um, especially at the point where David, when he's decided to go live up in the attic, starts drilling holes all throughout the ceiling so that he can spy on his roommates constantly. And the, the, the play of light and dust and how it creates this kind of um, fractured landscape, you know, almost like his mind is leaking out of him. It, it's just, I, I'm blown away by how everything is so aesthetically beautiful and daring and creepy and um, well thought out for uh, a film like this. And I think that is why it was such a great debut for Boyle as a director. 
you can see pieces of Boyle's future work in this. I mean, especially the doll. Oh, yeah, the doll obviously uh, reminds me, and that was what Mike had said as well to me uh, the other day when we were talking about this film of the doll in train spotting and the baby in train spotting. And those great little kind of whines of the baby. I mean, that that's really that's a really great moment when they go out, when Juliet and Alex go out and they start spending this money, uh, doing a little consumer therapy as it were, and kind of playing into that, uh, uh, post Thatcher, uh, economy that you guys were talking about that whole fuck you. I'm first kind of thing. And they don't care that going out and spending this money is going to possibly get them into trouble. And maybe that is what eventually gets them into trouble. But, yeah, when they go out on their shopping spree and uh, Eccleston, David comes back and he starts talking about how they are now completely fucked and just how their um, selfish act really has just put all of them in the ground, basically. And it's a very prophetic moment, definitely. And it for me, it really is that kind of turning point where he knows like he has to kind of be on his own now. He really can't rely on these other two people whatsoever. And he's got that line in there about... 500 pounds is what you paid for it. We don't know how much it cost us yet. For you two to have a good time, we don't know the cost of that yet. Right. (laughs) Such a good line. What did you guys think also about this motif? We see it again in Train Spotting and the idea of opening the film with, you know, the voiceover that that's supposed to clue you into where we're going. And also, you know, of course, Danny Boyle's obvious affection for left field, the band. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth because I was just like, oh, yeah, both of them are just steeped in left field. <laughs> to me, it works because I'm a big fan of in art, whether it's film, uh, usually in film, uh, the idea of bookends. I really like the idea of bookends, that there is this, uh, talking about Goodfellas again, in a way, there's kind of a bookends kind of thing with that. There's definitely bookends with this one and with train spotting. Um, To me, I like that idea. I like the idea that someone comes on screen and says, this is, you know, kind of cluing you into where we're going to go and where we'll eventually end up. And But in this movie, it's a dead guy who's telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it still works. I, I think sometimes the bookend stuff can be great. Um, and, and I think all the examples you gave are great. Um, I've certainly seen terrible examples of bookends, too. Saving Private Ryan comes to mind, <laughs> um, where you actually have Ryan reflecting back on scenes that he didn't partake in. Um, but... And and it can also sometimes, I think, feel overly schematic or tangential to the actual story. Um, but I think you're right. Here, the great thing about the, the bookends and the, is it's a very – he's making ironic statement about friendship of which he's not experienced and they never exhibit throughout this movie. And so even at the end, his lesson is that he believes in friendship. He just hasn't experienced it. Right. Well, there's there's also, when we talk about that, there are these shifts. And I kind of see that the film shifts on this um, lever of friendship. And it almost seems like it's built into the act structure. Because in the beginning, we get the feeling that David and Juliet are together. And then there's this like tension at the party, because you brought up the party, where there's like Alex and Juliet are kind of, you know in that space now and they've partnered up and then towards the end it seems like she's made another choice and she goes back to david and then that leads to another series of consequences well you i always got the feeling that she was just triangulating for whatever she needed and what's weird is you don't get the feeling that they're actually like in a relationship you get the feeling that it's just whoever she's fucking right (laughs) you know it's like which is much more primal which I think is kind of what they all get reduced to, um, to a certain extent that, you know, it becomes very base for them. I also think that it's interesting how Alex come, you know, at the beginning you would be forgiven if you mistook him for the alpha male at the house when he turns out to be anything but. Yeah. I mean, there are moments in here, like, especially when he, uh, hurts his ankles and, uh, doesn't, um, it, 
kind of gets assigned to be on the case once they find the shallow grave. And you would think, okay, here's where he's going to kind of turn it around and really kind of be more of the man of action. But he is just undercut all the time, especially when it comes to Cameron uh, coming back into the story. Because he came back into the story at that party. They humiliate him once again in a really uncomfortable way. And then Cameron is the one who manages to get his comeuppance, and it's not Alex. So it's just like, okay, yeah, that's kind of letting us know that Alex is not necessarily the man of action that he would like us to think that he is. And yet, there's the ending. (laughs) Right. Well, in that ending, I'm, yeah, there's a couple ways to take that. And I'm just like, I, I imagine that he is alive, but I'm not sure how much he is the winner. Who's that? Alex. No, I think that he is, um, you know, I, I, I think if anyone is one, I think he's the winner and that's why he's laughing. Yeah. I think he walks away with the cash. (laughs) I mean, I think that's, that's, I think that's the point of the ending is that at the end of the day, even though he wasn't the alpha, even though he wasn't the, the the toughest he outsmarted the other two yeah i i've heard an interesting theory as far as this film goes going back to the baby and uh the ties from this to train spotting somebody has said that it might be interesting if you think of train spotting as being the first film and shallow grave as being the follow up because of the hugo character and the way that he's just this kind of anonymous drug dealer in train spotting and maybe you know the end of his life is at this loft where these three prats are living. But I don't know. You can kind of – it's just an interesting way to play with it, I suppose. That sounds like fanboy theory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I wrote the slash fiction about uh, David and Alex. So if anybody wants to read that, you can just go to my blog. No, <laughs> okay. Well, 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 <laughs> I mean, the place where it doesn't play is also the fact that one of the two goons that are trying to track them down is like the nicest character in train spotting. Yeah. <laughs> so and I think what's interesting is that that you have this feeling of ambiguity about whether Alex wins, even though I think it's clear he does. And I think that ambiguity comes from the fact that we don't really care that he won. No. Like, because we don't care about them because they're not worth us caring about. They're all just such douchebags that whoever the victor is, yeah, okay, so he's the victor, but I, he was as much of a jerk as everybody else. Well, and they so undercut everything with that end credits music and the end credits, uh, the that kind of weird slow motion play back of the happier times of these three. And I just love that credit sequence where it's just like, yeah, these guys were always kind of jerks and here they are back before all the troubles, but you know, things weren't necessarily that great back then either. Yeah. With the Andy Williams too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well the other thing is too, with them, like you were talking about, he wins in the end, but, nobody cares is the fact that to me he seems the least deserving in that he didn't do anything like at least the other guy cut someone's hands and feet off and had to go through all this you know horribleness you mean and then ends up dying in the end it's like oh great you know don't don't bother trying to actually execute the plan just you know just refuse to kind of go along with things and tell people you can't. And then in the end, you can just swoop in and take all the money. Isn't that nice? Slacker. <laughs> God. There's that great scene where um, David says to him, well, you didn't have to cut his feet off right? You know, to put him in his place. Um, and yeah. like how that kind of shuts down his quips. Eccleson in this film, his performance is just so remarkable to me. He was the one when I saw this movie where I was just like, he's the guy to watch out for. Like him skittering around in the loft, a.k.a. attic, with all those uh, holes being cut and everything, and him looking down on everybody that's in the house and trying to figure out everything that's going on. I was just like, wow, this Christopher Eccleston guy, he's just going to do some amazing things in his life. And I was just so, uh, his performance just really turned me on watching it. And the funny thing is, of the three, he was the one who probably, I wouldn't say was the most known, but he at least had, um, 
you know, a film resume. He had been in P- Peter Medak's Let Him Have It, which right. was which was a pretty pretty good film. Um, you know, Ewan McGregor, this is literally the first big role he ever had, um, and only the second film he'd ever appeared in. Um, and Kerry Fox was mainly known for the Jane Campion film, um, An Angel at My Table. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have these three characters, three actors that literally, you know, none of them were particularly well known. And clearly it, it you know, got you and McGregor notice. Um, and I think, I think cause he's the cute one, but also because he's so absurdic. Yes. You know, <laughs> pe- people like sarcasm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and he some of his best roles definitely are when he is able to skirt that line between a hole and somebody that you would actually want to hang out with. I mean, because there are times where I'm like, maybe Renton would be okay to hang out with, and then other times I'm like, yeah, not really. Same thing with Obi Wan Kenobi. I'm I'm not really sure <laughs> if I want to hang out with Obi Wan or not. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if it means Liam and Jar Jar are coming along. Oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> fucking Anakin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, it is interesting. Hugh McGregor has always had a very interesting charisma to me as an actor. Sometimes I really love the work he does, and sometimes he just kind of disappears for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and he seems like one of those actors. I think he's an excellent actor. I just think directors don't always know what to do with him. And I think Boyle really gets him. Yeah, I think his best work has been with Boyle. And there are other times, you know, things like Big Fish. Uh, It's interesting how many times he's played the young version of other British actors, like where he's playing Albert Finney in Big Fish or where he's playing Alec Guinness in the Star Wars films. But even when he's not doing that, he does, he has managed to turn out some really solid roles, but yeah, then there are other things where it's just like, I would rather eat my own arm than watch him in that again, or watch that movie again. Just some of his choices or some of the movies he's ended up in. I'm like, "Eh, not really for me, but he does take a lot of chances, you know, things like, Moulin Rouge or Young Adam, things like that. It's like, okay, at least he's out there and he's trying some different stuff. Uh, and his new film that I'm hearing great things about where he plays Christ and Satan um, in the desert. So, yeah, I think, he, I think he's a very good actor. Um, again, I just think they don't always know what to do. Him. He's, not quite, he's not quite leading man. He's not, quite, he's not like quite the dad character, even though he's old enough now. Um, although he seems eternally youthful. Mm. Um, Damn him to hell. Yeah, I know. I mean, it is amazing. You look at him and you go, holy crap, that guy's in his 40s. He looks great. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't look that great. There are times, yeah, he's he's exactly one year and two days older than I am. So it really does kind of, you know, chafe my ass that he does look so good at his age. Um, I kind of wonder if... James McAvoy has kind of usurped him because there are times where James McAvoy will be in roles where I'm just like, I will actually get them confused and start thinking to myself, oh, is is this an Ewan McGregor role that James McAvoy is playing? Is he playing Ewan McGregor? Like when uh, I just recently watched Filth, uh, and I know it's probably because it's based on an Irvin Welsh novel, but I really was getting a um, a, 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 a new McGregor vibe from it. Which makes you wonder, like, is that from the writing, or is that because McGregor put his imprint so much on it that, you know, other actors are just naturally going to f- follow that lead. Right. And then that makes me think about movies like Trance, which is another I, I can't remember did, did uh yeah, that was another Hodge and Boyle production with McAvoy in it and I was just like I wonder if they had to go with McAvoy cuz um then, he wasn't available. And another example of like a script that is fine but Boyle just directs the shit out of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And and the thing about Boyle is like I you know to me he's like he's a true rock and roll director like he brings that kind of energy to his films that are reactive and energetic that favor kind of style over moralism or subtext 
and that he's always playing, he's being inventive and he's playing with the pacing and you just, it's, it, it, you almost get the feeling that the amps are turned up to 11 when he's directing and which is why sometimes he's not right for certain material. And I think that's probably why Steve Jobs, the new movie is having some issues is, you know, you're, you've got this rock and roll director and you've got friggin' Aaron Sorkin who writes endless, you know, conversations and, uh, you know, no matter how amazingly talented you as a director, it's hard to make endless conversations fun to watch. I think that when you look at a movie like Shallow Grave, you can see the template for the kinds of films he's going to make later and how he's going to approach them and how, um, like, he actually said that he thought that, this is a quote from him, he said that cinema should be as much like a car crash as possible. <laughs> that it's like the extremes of violence and beauty. And I think he really does direct that way. <laughs> the extremes of violence and beauty really play into something like a sunshine where it is so gorgeous and so well done in those first two acts. And then it just becomes a car crash in the third act. Yes, it does. All right. We're going to take a break and play an interview with John Hodge, the screenwriter of shallow grave after these important messages. Let me ask you a question. Are you getting enough? I bet you'd love more, right? Well, adamneed.com wants to give you more with 10 free gifts. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, a specially selected toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. So what do you have to do to get your 10 free gifts? It's not hard. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code BOOTH at checkout, and you'll get all 10 free gifts. Go check out adamandeve.com today. Select one item and get 10 free gifts, including free shipping when you enter offer code BOOTH. That's B-O-O-T-H at adamandeve.com. Christopher Media, the Weedsman Podcast. Here's rickets, polio, conjunctivitis, AIDS. AIDS. <laughs> It's just go hog wild. Be in the car accident. You just use a little bit and you'll be fine. Yeah, rub it on your car and yourself. <laughs> It'll fix your car and your bones. <laughs> Try this special trick to get out of traffic tickets with Rick Simpson oil. Rub it on the cop. <laughs> He'll just go away. <laughs> the Weedsman Podcast. Every Friday on iTunes and ChristopherMedia.net. Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Hi, this is Andrew from We Hate Movies, and you're listening to the Projection Booth. If you feel like laughing after listening to some serious film discussion, head on over to our show, whmpodcast.com. Every Tuesday, a new episode drops, us ragging on bad movies, whereas the good folks here at the Projection Booth are talking about good, hearty, cinema-related stuff. Go here for the cinema. Come to us for the laughs afterwards. We Hate Movies every Tuesday. Movies need only three things. Badasses. You tell me who you want done, and I'll do the hell out of it. A chick with drive who don't take no jive. Boobs. Do you know that the female breast, known to be the source of life since Eve, can be deadly weapons? And body counts. Mathematics of murder and menace. The BBNBC podcast discusses lesser known action, exploitation, and horror cult cinema. You can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher Smart Radio, and SoundCloud by searching for BBNBC podcast. You can also listen to each episode directly on the show's website at badassesboobsandbodycounts.com. Got the goddamn message? Let's go to work.
It's, uh, I'm John Hodge. I'm a scriptwriter. It's my understanding that uh, before you got into screenwriting, uh, you were planning medicine? I, it's true. I was, in fact, I, I, I qualified um, from Edinburgh University with a degree in medicine, and I was working as a junior doctor when I started writing the script for Shallow Grave, yeah. And how did that process uh, happen for you to uh, start writing and specifically Shallow Grave? I think um, script writing was just something for movies, was something I wanted to do since I was really a teenager or possibly even younger. Um, I just thought that would be a kind of fun thing to do. Um, so I never aspired to be an actor or to direct. <laughs> so it was the script writing, I also quite like that idea. Um, but, you know, it's not something... I, I didn't, the idea of just leaving school and becoming a scriptwriter fortunately did not occur to me. Um, I thought I should do something a bit more practical, first of all. Um, but, you know, even when I was... You know, medicine was good. I enjoyed that. But while I was doing it, I sort of... I always thought, no, I want to give this other ambition. I want to give it a shot sometime. And so after the dust had settled and uh, my, you know... <laughs> I'd got into the groove of meds and I had made a little bit of time and just um, once I had the idea, which came to me one day, I just started writing um, and so did it in my spare time until I had sort of a script. And at that point, I was fortunate because my sister knew someone who worked as a location manager in the television show and he wanted to produce a film. That was His name was Andrew McDonald and I, he and I got together, we got on well same age, same sort of interests and same ambitions in terms of movies. And, uh, you know, he, he, he kind of <laughs> announced himself as producer. So that, that's, the, that's how it worked for me. Was that original idea, Shallow Grave? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was entirely <laughs> original. Uh, there's other examples of a similar sort of premise. I mean, most uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre and uh, one or two others, I think. But what kind of inspired me more than those, in a way, was, um, you know, it's... Uh, Around that time, I'd been watching sort of a few times. I'd watched Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and I'd watched Blood Simple, and I was struck in both of those uh, films by what was achieved using a very small cast and just moving the pieces around the board in a kind of imaginative way. And that, that was, for me, it was that kind of claustrophobia and both kind of emotional and, and physical that I wanted to try and you know, emulate. I mean, for me, watching the film, it seems like there's this nastiness that's just um, hanging out underneath the surface, and at times it does make itself uh, known, sort of this sneer, the, um, I guess maybe the interview scene at the beginning, uh, where they're looking for a flatmate, kind of describes that to me in some way. Yeah, I think there's certain sort of self-satisfaction in, in the characters, and, you know, obviously they sort of... They have their own world, which is sort of physical in that apartment, um, but they're sort of disconnected from, from the you know, sort of good nature of people uh, in the way that they sort of treat other people, but also from the sort of real threat that eventually comes, that eventually does arrive on their doorstep. So they're just, I suppose, I was, I was slightly interested in the, the idea of these people who can live, you know. In, in a sort of one of those apartments in a bubble in a way and, and everything seems very right until it goes wrong and then just sort of see what happens with their friendship at that point. I agree they're not entirely they're not entirely sympathetic. I didn't mean them to be entirely unsympathetic, but I wasn't trying to portray them as um uh, kind of the innocent victims. Where did, um, when you think back, and I know it has been uh, a, a while since since you wrote it, what was it that uh, got you on the path to write it? What was uh, an idea, a thought that, uh, do you remember? Oh, was, I remember where I was. I was out walking in, in hills in England. That day. I remember just the idea coming to me. Because, I, as I said, I was looking for some an idea that could take place largely sort of indoors with a small number of people. And, you know, at that time of life, you tend to share accommodation with other people. And it is it can be... Uh, it obviously can be great fun, but it can be also times when you just hate, hate them, you know, uh, and you have feelings of violence towards them, and no doubt they have feelings of violence towards you. And uh, sort of it was those the, those feelings going around in my head 
collided with the re requirement to come up with an idea to write a script. And I just thought, okay, a lot of it's about money. Um, you know, and the money turns out to be really just provocation for the split that might have happened anyway. So that that was, yeah, that was, what, that was where it came from. You know, from the time that you met Andrew McDonald till you were able to put the film together, how was that process? It was very sort of exciting for me because I'd never never done film development before. Um, film development is less exciting for me now. Um, but, uh, you know, we we took, you know, I did some work on the script. And eventually, we took it to a kind of arts funding body, which paid me, you know, gave Andrew a few thousand pounds to pay me to do another draft and so on, which was kind of exhilarating. The idea that someone would actually pay you for your work was, was a novel. Um, and then with the sort of script as it advanced after that, we eventually took it to, in, by six months later or something, we took it to film four and we had a sort of charmed existence there, which was after a couple of, after a meeting or a couple of meetings and a sort of further draft, they, they asked us, they said they wanted to do it if we could just find a director. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it just all seems kind of impossibly easy in retrospect. But it was, it was good fun. And how did that come about with uh, Danny Boyle? How did you guys find him? And Andrew went just did a sort of a tour around various directors. I think I'm not sure how many he met. Maybe I don't think it was more than half a dozen. Um, maybe less than that even. I'm not sure. And you know, he met Danny, and uh, he thought he was, you know, stood out as as the best. And what he had to say about the script seemed closest to chime with what Andrew and I were hoping for and um, we were very pleased to to have him on board and that was you know Channel 4 were very or Film 4 were very keen on him and that um, really put the project underway. I mean this is your your first project and uh, what sort of lessons did you learn about the writer did you get to keep most of the stuff that was in there or did you find some changes or? Yeah I mean there were so I, mean, I think one of the sort of, sort of enjoyable sort of facts of life when you're making a very low budget film is that there isn't so much room to mess around. So you tend to, everyone tends to focus on getting the script, particularly I suppose with a sort of genre picture thriller, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, get the script in place, and then we had five weeks of photography, and you know, it's just um, there isn't much time to pause and uh, just. Uh, you know, everything was pretty much filmed as it was in the script, really, in terms of uh, the scenes and the dialogue and so forth. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, one of the things I learned, obviously, was how much you gain from the actors and how much, really, you should just trust to them. You know, the, if they've got the idea for the character, they'll find a way to express it. And it's not it's not really about dialogue or stage direction or anything like that. It's just about finding the right actors to play the right parts um, and similarly the other thing because of having a low budget was that you don't really plan for much in the way of pickups or reshoots that's very limited so the sort of the mentality of oh yeah well if this doesn't work out we can sort it out afterwards doesn't really apply there's a there's a lot of pressure to get it right there and then and I think that's that's quite healthy and speaking of the actors um, how was that casting process and working with those folks well I mean, obviously, casting the sort of is primarily in the um, you know, in the director's uh, sort of remit, um, but Danny was very kind of collaborative and wanted Andrew and I to kind of be there, uh, you know, to I suppose to support his his what were obviously finally his choices, um, because he, and you know. I, yes, I think that's obviously is, was misleading for me in the sense that most directors wouldn't be anywhere near the, the casting, um, and you know, because I didn't, I didn't really, I would never have expected it, and I wouldn't have expected it since. Um, for an actor, for a writer, it, it's interesting to to see or hear different actors talking about how about their how they would approach it, about how they interpret it. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm still, you know, it's, it's it's the director's business, really. So uh, Danny wanted to work with those actors, and um, fortunately they all said yes. And it's interesting because this is sort of, I guess, the first time, at least for me, when I originally saw it, that um, Ewan McGregor and Christopher Eggleston were in here. So 
you know, um, you obviously worked with uh, Ewan McGregor. I mean, the scripts that that you wrote in the later pictures. Yeah. So, um, how did you guys get along? Well, I mean, when we met Ewan, um, sorry, it's my phone. Ring. He, I'm just trying to think about how first I met Ewan. So, um, he, um. He brought, you know, when he came in, I mean, and I do remember him auditioning, actually. I mean, you don't really get him to read, but he, he brought a great deal of, of easygoing charm, I think, to the part. And, oh, sorry, but was, I mean, Ewan is you know, a terrific actor, and he's very likable and easy to get on with. And the way I think that almost sort of conceals the intensity and kind of, so method in a general sense that he applies to his work because obviously some actors uh, that you meet don't appear you know even when you first meet them to have a kind of uh, sort of thespian intensity about them which you can and you can see how that they, they, you know, might then be applied to um, you know creating the, the the part that they play um, but I you know when you meet you and you I, I don't think you really sense that you just there's a sense of a kind of he's a good looking guy he's charismatic he's very charming stuff like that but it's only when you actually see him at work even sometimes when you see him at work it's not you don't really read what he's doing until you see it on the screen and I felt that very much uh, with uh, you know, I think particularly with train spotting um, that he had a, I think he had a sense then of I don't know this a sense that sort of Bollocks, but it's true. He, you know, he he obviously knew what he was doing completely. And you know, you, when he's when he's off off work, you know, he's off off set as it were. You know, he's just he's just himself. But then when he goes on, he has the ability to to sink deep into the part and to really deliver. As for Shallow Grave, when it was released, what was the reaction like? You know, there and also for yourself, how did you take it in? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, for first-time filmmaker, first-time scriptwriter, it was just kind of it was incredibly exciting to make the film. And but you know, through my sort of naivety, I just assumed everything would go well, um, not being aware of the kind of myriad of ways in which a film can go hopelessly wrong. I've learned them all since, um, or several of them anyway. Uh, but it was, you know, it was just all, it was all great fun. It was all exciting. You know, I mean, we screened the film for Polygram and uh, they they bought it for distribution which was, which was great because um, that, you know, that you know, meant that it was going to or had a good chance of reaching an audience and we went to Cannes which was great fun because I didn't do any interviews at all I just kind of looked around and it was all just fun and um, and then when we started showing it to the press I mean obviously you get mixed receptions but generally it was positive and even more so Danny and Andrew and I went around to the UK um, to kind of small cinemas and we showed the film and we did you know introduced it and took questions afterwards which was a really good way of reaching an audience which you know had never heard of Danny Boyle and had never heard of really probably never heard of Ewan McGregor or Christopher Eccleston or um, (laughs) never heard anything to do with me so that, that and, and the reception we got from those audiences was 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 very positive. You know, really got the feeling that people enjoy the film. That was pretty sort of straightforward, um, you know, dark thriller, but which sort of spoke to them about their their you know British life. And um, you know, that was that was very kind of rewarding. Then out of that success, that made it possible for you. To end up writing the adaptation on train spotting? Yes, it led pretty directly to it. Um, it uh, because it was again it was film four, and I remember sort of after Charlotte Grave had come out and it had done you know reasonably well at the box office, and we went to meet the head of film four, a uh, chap called David Alkin, who as I actually remember for some reason there was a bomb scare in the building. We had to leave the building, go to a cafe across the road, and we got there, and he said. So I hear you've got an interest in this book about drug addicts injecting heroin into their penises. And we said, well, dear, it's not quite like that, but yes, it's that sort of thing. And he said, well, I think that sounds like an excellent idea. We, we'll, we'll support you in that film, um, which which they did. Uh, I mean, obviously, it wouldn't it need, need necessarily have been that simple if we'd come back with some ludicrous budget or something like that. But, you know, having 
having sort of been with us and making Charlie Gray the same financiers wanted to carry on and that relationship was kind of freedom of that relationship was was crucial in allowing us to move forward in train spotting. For the production on that one, I mean obviously you guys had learned a bit from the first film and how did how did that adaptation come together? Because I have read uh, the novel, uh, and it seems that uh, there's so much stuff in that book. There's so many threads. So how? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm which I'm going back to right now. Um, yeah, for, it's just a process of elimination. You just write down all the different threads, and then kind of some of the ones you like the most you keep, and you just try and chop them about a bit to see, make them kind of go alongside one another, one another either in a way that's kind of yeah, I don't know the dovetails or contrast or something like that and gradually leads you to um, uh, I don't know some what feels like some point resolution I mean that sounds pretty chaotic but then that's what the film is that film is slightly chaotic isn't it it doesn't really uh, no narrative kicks in until the final third or final quarter and it's kind of no worse for that in fact it's stuff without narrative that's sort of better isn't it was the idea to focus it all through uh, Renton? It was, yes, very much so, yeah. I mean, if you read the book, his is the kind of, seems to be the sort of strongest voice. I was going to ask on it because I'm uh, the, the son of a Scottish immigrant, so oh, yeah. watching Shallow Grave and Train Spotting and, and all of your, you know, all the early work, uh, Life Less Ordinary, things like that, um, has obviously these Scottish elements much more uh, yes. in Shallow Grave yeah. and Train Spotting. Um, do you find that there is something that is unique uh, to that culture, to that voice um, that you like? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I suppose all, I mean all, in the sense that all kind of cultures are, are unique, aren't they? And um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, but certainly within within the UK, uh, if you go that far, it's it's very distinctive, uh, both sort of linguistically and I think with sort of subtle cultural differences. Which aren't a big deal, you know, <laughs> from a global sense. But they're for those of us who live here. Um, and it, what's it to do? Something maybe to do with sense of humour, I think, um, and to do with, kind of, unfortunately, attitudes to alcohol and self-destructiveness and uh, the effects of a kind of cold, dark climate, things like that. Um, yeah, I think there is. I think there. Are, I think there are. It is a. It is. It is distinctive. I think uh, Mike Myers nailed it pretty well, actually. I think in, um, have you seen Help, I Married an Axe Murderer? Yeah. The depiction of the Scottish family in that is pretty fantastic. He's <laughs> got the father, he'd, he'd, he'd cry himself to sleep on his big pillow, and that's very funny. Uh, it was kind of an affectionate but pretty accurate portrayal, I think. I've just always felt that there's a level of sarcasm and biting humor that seems to be uh, alive, at least in the Scottish folks I know. Yeah, I, I think so. I think in picking, you know, in, sorry, in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, I think people, it, I, I know so I live in England now and I definitely notice the difference when I go back, that people are, are almost continuously sarcastic, actually, and that they never say what they mean. Everything is supposed to mean the opposite of what they say. It's kind of strange. I can't remember if it was in the novel, but the um, the shite being Scottish bit. Oh, yes, uh, that's in the novel. That's 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 sort of in some... Roughly, I think I paraphrased a bit, but yeah, that's his. his, his uh, yeah, he was. His, I mean, the novel's great. I, you know, because I reread it again recently, and it's just. Uh, talk about uh, you know whether something unique in Scottish culture or not, or something particular. Anyway, I mean that book is a, is a brilliant expression of language. I think as much as anything, it's just fantastic, and um, the way it just captures the way people really speak and the way they really think. It's brilliant. You know, doing an adaptation of a of a novelist who's dead is probably easier. <laughs> Did you have any concern? This is your second script and the writer not only has a cameo in the film, but he's kind of around still. So how was... Yeah, well, I mean, yes, it could have been awful, couldn't it? Um, but Irvin was great. I mean, he, I think when he first met us, he was a bit nervous because I don't think he... But uh, as we were... I don't think nervous in the sense of intimidated, but nervous in the sense of when I'm really going to let these idiots mess up my novel. But he got on board, and once he was on board, he was just really positive and really helpful. And he's been that way ever since, very kind of generous. And he's got a real philosophy of standing back and saying, you know, I'm here to help, and my book is my book, but, you know, your film is your own business. And um, couldn't ask for more. Couldn't ask for more from the, from the novelist. He's, he's a great guy. And if you go to Edinburgh and Irvin's company, which I've done once or twice, 
every door is open to you. He knows absolutely everyone. It's incredible. He must he seems to be on first name terms with everyone. It's like being with I don't know, it's like being some sort of rock star or something. Well he's probably, at least to me, over here in the States, the best known Scottish writer of the past twenty five years. Yeah, yeah, I would think he is. I suppose globally, yes. Yeah. I mean in the UK there are sort of a couple of bigger selling ones, I imagine, in in banks and uh sort of detective novels and stuff like that. But yeah, he I think he's probably globally the most famous, isn't he? Well, I think you had kind of mentioned um, in your answer to uh, Train Spotting that you're looking at it again. So, are you part of the uh, the group that's doing the sequel? Yeah, um, I'm pleased to say that I am involved. Yeah, um, you know, and it's all still subject to contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, even with the best of intentions, which is what we have, um, films can still fall through for many different reasons um, and not and not happen. And we've, you know, in this case, we have. A, the, the, the actors are at least two of them are committed to other you know uh, very tightly committed contractually to television shows long running television shows in in the u s so our window to uh, of opportunity to make the film i think is is very tight next summer if if we're going to do it so you know people are even as I speak people are exchanging emails back and forth to try and make it all happen and make sure everyone's contractually happy. Um, so, you know, keep fingers crossed it'll go ahead, but uh, yes, at the moment I'm, I'm involved. When you look at that possibility of revisiting with these characters 20 odd years later, um, is that, uh, <laughs> make you nervous? Is that exciting for you? Well, the characters, though, I mean, the characters are the reason to do it. And, you know, we watch the film and it's like the performances of all, all the, all the actors. And you think, well, everyone, I, I want to see Robert Carlyle be big, big, and I want to see you and Brenda. I want, I want to, I want Spud back in my life. You know, it's great. And writing those characters is really easy because honestly, they speak, you know, they have their own voice and I just transcribe it onto the paper. Finding a narrative that somehow is much more difficult because the first film is a kind of, is about being young and being self-destructive and in love and all that which is really interesting to watch on the screen. But being in your 40s is not about being self-destructive and in love. <laughs> it's a little bit more boring, isn't it? So it's you know, trying to find something that feels fitting but worthwhile. Has any of the other previous work that included those characters written by Irvin Welsh uh, given you any interest, any idea? You mean any of the other novels? Right. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, the, he did write a kind of sequel porno, which we've taken a little bit from, but... Um, just limited. No, actually, it's still, yeah, from that, but actually, it's funny, going back to the first book, there's almost, that the inspiration is in there as well, of what, the, you know, just in a strange way of what, what might have happened with the characters later on. As of late, uh, reconnected to work with Danny Boyle on a film, and you guys worked together on, I guess, four scripts, right, at least? Uh, yes, that's right, yes. Five, five, five we did, we've done all together together, yeah. So, can you tell me about the latest one you guys did together? Oh, trans. Yeah, um, well, that was something that had been around for quite a long time um, as a script which Danny had liked, you know, by um, Joe Hearn, um, which um, Danny had he'd been a real fan of. And had, at one point, I think several years ago, he'd, he'd looked at making it. Um, but just for one reason or another, it didn't happen. And then, you know, he went off and did other things, and including Slumdog Millionaire and the London Olympics. And he, but he kind of carried a torch for it and wanted to make it. And, and um, we, he talked to me about it, and you know, I was really keen. And uh, we we took it forward. I thought you know, it was a great idea and a great script, and um, a great. You know, it was really sort of enjoyable for me to work on. And for some uh, the other work that you've had recently, uh, the program. This is something yes. with yes. Um, you know another sort of well-known uh, director. Yeah, with Stephen Frears, yes. Yeah, I don't have a great deal to say about Stephen. I've only worked with him once. Um, you know, it, it was a totally different experience, um, I have to say. Uh, he's got a totally different way of working. Um, much more kind of, I don't know, lazy fair and less kind of particular about detail and vision and so forth. So, but but he has his own, you know, he has his own way Um so yeah, no, it's, you know, it's sort of chalk and cheese. Really, I can't really, can't really make much in the way of comparison. Different guys. But as for the film itself, uh, it just came out uh, this fall, I take it. Yes, that's right. Yeah, not to, to you know, it's not going to shake the box office, unfortunately. 
Um, we had some decent reviews, and uh, the film is very solid. I think Ben Foster gives an absolutely fantastic performance, but it hasn't really worked. Um, well, it hasn't, has, has failed at the box office, really, which is unfortunate, and I feel uh, feel bad for Ben because he's brilliant. Anyone who takes, I would recommend the film, actually, anyone who takes the time to see it will, will be rewarded by his performance and, and also those of the rest of the cast. It's, they're very good. I think it's it's a tough sale, obviously, because he's not a particularly sympathetic character, although I think we've portrayed him quite sort of three-dimensionally. Um, and perhaps it's a story people already feel, although I'd have to say there's a lot of detail in the, in the picture that um, you, you won't have heard before. So as for working with Danny Boyle over 20 years in five pictures, how do you how do you find your relationship? Well, getting back together was was great. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, relationship. I suppose you settle into your roles a bit more after a while, don't you? <laughs> you just, uh, you kind of have some sense of what the other person is, how they're likely to react to any given material, but then there are all the surprises as well. So, I mean, it's, we get we get on all right. <laughs> I think that's a basis for a working relationship. I like him. You know, thinking back on uh, Shallow Grave for you, what lessons do you think you learned putting that film together, writing that film, that have uh, worked out for you for your career going forward? Yeah, the lessons from Shallow Grave. And I think I learned almost no lessons from Shallow Grave because it was ridiculously easy. You know, I say it was misleadingly easy in terms of how easily it got made, uh, and then how easily uh, this kind of sales went, how easily, uh, how well distribution went, and how successful it was at the box office. Um, it took me many, many uh, further attempts to unlearn all those misleading lessons and discover that generally your script will not be made. Generally, when it does get made, it will be a real struggle. Generally, it won't be quite satisfactory when you make it. Uh, distributors may be, you know, difficult, and then you know, you don't always have a hit. That's the truth, isn't it? But um, you know, I certainly learn from all those. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I'm really so sort of thrilled that you've taken an interest in it, and uh, you know, it's a film that I'm sort of proud of my participation in, and so on. So, um, you know, I'm really, really glad that you're got an interest. Thank you very much. If we if we make trains flying to come back to me again and we'll, we'll I'll gladly talk we'll talk again you know if, if you have any interest around that time that would be that'd be my pleasure oh definitely thank you so much great okay cheers thank you to John Hodge for joining us and you can learn more about his work on our website projection-booth.com we're back and talking about Shallow Grave now gents you alluded to this in the front part of the show talking a bit about sort of crime films of the early 90s especially that boom I think after uh, Reservoir Dogs and definitely Pulp Fiction and sort of how do you see Shallow Grave fitting into that uh, I guess raft of crime film neo-noir all that stuff I I know that definitely Pulp Fiction, uh, you know, started off the whole Tarantino clones kind of thing, and and there was that after Reservoir Dogs as well, this little indie film that took the world by storm, and you had all these you know really shitty movies and occasionally some good ones that came out of that. Um, but for me, I think that it actually goes back a little bit further, and I want to say that I see a lot of Shallow Grave and a lot of these other kind of neo noirs owing to more of the Coen brothers' Blood Simple, because I know that really put the zap on a lot of filmmakers' uh, heads as well. So I think that that was kind of a little bit more influential, at least uh, I would say that's kind of what lit the fire, and then the pot boiled over with Pulp Fiction. And you would be correct with John Hodge, as he did say in the interview, it was Blood Simple that was a big influence on him for this one. Ta-da! Yeah. Point for Mike. Yeah, well, I would totally say Blood Simple. I also think, you know... This movie, Boyle followed kind of a tradition of interesting 80s directors who'd kind of lost steam. If you look, you know, in the in the late 70s and mid 80s, you had a really interesting thing going on in British cinema where you had directors like Alan Parker and Mike Figgis and Neil Jordan and Stephen Frears all coming up where you had these movies like uh, The Company of Wolves and The Long Good Bo- Friday, The Long Friday, Long Good Friday and My Beautiful Andrette. And they started to kind of, I think, move the needle uh, a, a little into what kind of this gritty British 
um, sensibility that still had, that was still being influenced by the French new wave. And I think Boyle is kind of a direct response to that. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he, um, he had worked with Alan Clark, who was part of that group too. And I think at the same time in the U S like you said, you had blood simple and you also had, you know, the success of a movie like the grifters and, um, and this kind of rediscovery of Jim Thompson and which I think is, Yes, Reservoir Dogs was part of that, um, but I think this movement was, like Mike said, underway before Pulp Fiction hit. Uh, and the 90s really became this, I think, really interesting decade for these kind of movies. Um, you had L.A. Confidential. You had the Wachowskis' first movie, Bound. You had uh, even, you know, at, at a, in the late 90s, you had the Croupier coming about, and um, you had... Uh, Leon the Professional in 94. So I think you had this really interesting renaissance of nihilistic crime films that were testing the boundaries of what we expected from the genre and really indulging in uh, that kind of Jim Thompson sensibility or taking pulp and making it a little darker, a little more violent, a little... uh, a little more brutal in its in its attitude. Oh, and I forgot. I forgot the one that I love the most from 94, which is The Last Seduction. Um, oh, yeah. Which I think embodied a lot of what was going on then. And if you look at The Last Seduction and Shallow Grave, which are only a year apart, are actually quite similar in sensibility. A lot of unlikable characters all trying to screw each other over for the money. Yeah, I mean, even some of the the failures during that time were interesting. I mean, even something like a a, a Palmetto I found to be a very interesting film. And just uh, watching them kind of play around with some of the tropes of noir and neo-noir. And just – so, yeah, there were some interesting things out there. I I know one that a lot of people overlook is um, Romeo is Bleeding. That was a snort of, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a that one really worked for me and just because of, again, some really unlikable characters in that one and just that kind of unstoppable uh, Lena Olin character. I was just like, yeah, yeah, this really works well for me. So um, it, it definitely Shallow Grief fits in really well with some of those films. I also think of like even Strange Days, which was a – science fiction, you know, ostensibly, but it really is one of those ugly noir films again. Oh yeah. You know, where, and I think, I think that was definitely what was in the water. I mean, even, you know, you even had eventually uh, Oliver Stone trying to cash in as usual at the end of the movement with (laughs) U-turn, you know, which was another nasty kind of, you know, desert noir, which, you know, probably John Dahl, started that whole idea of whatever noir soleil, I guess, or something you could call it. Yeah. Between red rock West and uh, kill me again. Those were definitely the very sun sun bleach, but those fit in as well to the, some of the earlier ones. I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, like uh, high Sierra and some of those films where they were all taking place during the day or something like, um, what was it? Uh, Nightfall, where so much of that takes place in this really well lit, snowy field, and everything, where you've got the oil there or oil uh, uh, pump out there, and everything, and there's no shadows whatsoever. Um, but it, it just it really uh, the noir sensibility comes through. Yeah, and it's just that feeling of these people who, at the end of the day, they will they will shoot or stab you and to get that money, you know, and they're, that they are, there is not a moral quandary for them. And it's really kind of um, watching predators trying to outmaneuver each other. So as for Danny Boyle, you talked a bit about that in the first part, but when we look at sort of his reoccurring ideas and themes and, and such, what do we see in shallow grave that uh, reminds us of, other stuff that he's done. I mean, obviously there's a couple of, I would say direct nods and visual style and even the thing with the baby, um, the doll in here though, uh, to train spotting the next film. Yeah. I also think there's, um, kind of the lurid color schemes that he uses 
Um, you start to see those elsewhere too. I mean, he's a very visually kinetic uh, director. He likes movement a lot. So it, whether it's people running through streets or cars careening down, you know, streets or um, there's always this sense of movement to what he's doing. And I think that he keeps that all the way through Slumdog and, you know, even into 127 hours, you see some of that, you know, even James Franco's like hallucinations in 127 hours have this weird kineticism to them where you're like driving along in this car and, and it's this, 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 uh, you know, nightmare escape. Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, he's a rock and roll director there's this just incredible energy that he puts into everything. And trance, I think, is kind of the culmination of watching him pump up a kind of, you know, decent script, but he's giving it, he's just pumping on all cylinders, <laughs> directing the hell out of it. <laughs> I can see a lot of the paranoia that our characters have in Shallow Grave coming back in something like The Beach and some of the stuff in 28 Days Later. And probably a little bit in Sunshine, but definitely for me, the beach where none of the characters can really trust one another. And they're put into this situation where just things and, – and it's funny that you you know compared some of the characters to sharks earlier on because I, I, I seem to remember some sharks going on in the beach as well, but uh, literal in that case. But yeah, just that whole uh, idea of not being able to trust the people that you're with, especially in these stressful situations, uh, I, I find that to be uh, in the beach a lot and a little bit there in uh, Sunshine. Not necessarily seen a lot of that in Slumdog Millionaire, but uh, you know that one stands out to me as being different in a lot of respects, but as far as the rock and roll goes that you're talking about and the color scheme and the kineticism – that's there in spades. I also think he's not a director who sits in judgment of his characters very much. No. Um, which is, I think, refreshing. Um, I think he just takes them as they are and tells their story. And he's not really interested in delivering some kind of message about their behavior. He's leaving that up to you. And I think that's been consistent throughout his career. Even though Slumdog has, you know... I would say Slumdog and Millions are his more sentimental films. They're still, they still have a, a kind of a detachment and in a good way, not, uh, not, you know, some directors can be so detached that um, they, the, the, their impact on the film is alienating. I think Boyle lets people just be people and, you know, whatever you think of them, that's up to you. He's, he's not gonna, he's not going to intervene there. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's part of the reason why I like his films because I don't necessarily feel that he judges his characters. I think that if you would have put train spotting in the hands of someone who was a heavy moralist, it would have been so heavy handed. And so, see, these people are awful. Look at what they do to each other. Or this film that we're talking about, Shallow Grave, much the same. And instead, it's just, no, just let them play out and let the audience figure out how they feel about them. Well, that's the thing with train spotting too, is that it starts off so fun. I mean, it is like that spiral of drug addiction where everything is so fantastic at the beginning, so powerful. And I mean, the, the scenes of them running through the street with Iggy Pop blaring on the soundtrack. I mean, that is some of the best stuff that I've ever seen. And Renton with his voiceover, you know, Choose Life, all this stuff fantastic and then and it's still fun for a long time even with bigby and the way that he's uh um you know smashing people over the face with with glasses and everything that violence and and just his uh viciousness there's still a little bit of fun just kind of watching that and being part of that and uh just it, it, it you know even the the well of course the the shitting the bed scene there's so many great moments to that and it just starts narrowing and narrowing and narrowing until things aren't necessarily quite as fun anymore and things really start to go off the tracks with that and um you know it's a uh, it ends up being one of the most depressing films that you've ever seen but it's amazing that he's able to take us from this joy de vivre all the way down into you know the nightmare scene with the baby on the ceiling it, it, that a director is able to take us on that journey is pretty remarkable 
and still not judge. No. <laughs> and that's what's amazing. And what's even more amazing is when you consider how much he comes from this kind of Catholic background where, like he said that, you know, he was on this path where everybody was telling him he was going to be a priest. <laughs> um, and that it wasn't until he was in his teens that he realized, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and um, I love that he he was saying that he actually, in the end, he really thinks that there isn't that much difference between being a priest and being a director. Um, <laughs> like there's a quote where he says, it's basically the same job. You ponce around and tell people what to think. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, you know, you know, you look at him and Martin Scorsese also had that kind of background. John Woo had that background. And I think it's, I think it's interesting that these, unlike Scorsese and Wu, which I think have kept a certain amount of, I don't want to say they're judgmental, but they definitely, they're definitely, there is definitely morality kind of, you know, haunting their films. Boyle seems to have shed it gleefully. Like that just doesn't seem to be part of the equation for him. Um, And I think that's interesting, especially when, I, I, I was reading that Britain, the most influential Catholic publication in England, is something called The Tablet. And in 2010, they said that Danny Boyle was the most influential Roman Catholic <laughs> <laughs> at the time. And, they, and Boyle says he doesn't even identify as Catholic. Um, he says he's an atheist. But um, I just think that – and I think that may be the difference between him and Scorsese and Wu and people like that is that he is an atheist and they still are part of their religion. All right, we're going to take another break and play an interview from Mark Browning, the author of Danny Boyle, Lust for Life, critical analysis of all the films from Shallow Grave to 127 Hours. My name is Mark Browning. Um, what I do, uh, that's a bit more complicated. Um, by profession, I'm a teacher, uh, but I've taught in various different places, different subjects, including film studies at different schools and uh, university in England. Um, I've written various books on different directors, David Fincher, David Cronenberg, anyone called David, basically, um, Wes Anderson and, and Danny Boyle. Um, so film is something that's that's been a great passion of mine as a as a film goer and probably over the last 15 20 years as a as someone who writes about it um as a as an academic I, I sort of write the books that academics have to do in professional jobs even though I'm, I'm not actually at a at a university myself right now as for danny boyle why a book on danny boyle well that kind of came out of the book i did on david fincher um it probably started around the 2009 Oscar ceremony when Danny Boyle was there to collect um, a number of trophies, but uh, specifically for the for best film for um, Slumdog Millionaire. And he was up against David Fincher's Benjamin Button uh, in a number of categories and, and uh, managed to win every one. And I just, it just struck me having, having spent some time thinking about Fincher's work what it was about Fincher that made it impossible for me to imagine how he could have made Slumdog. What what would he have done with that? And um, and I just couldn't see that it was possible. Which made me think, well, what is it about Danny Boyle that um, that leads him to, to to projects like Slumdog? Because the more you look at Slumdog, it, it just seems such an impossible film to make. Um, I couldn't imagine being someone going to a producer and saying, here's this film. Um, a large portion of which is in Hindi, no stars, nothing to put on billboards, only child actors, all of whom are unknown, two sets of child actors, and then uh, we somehow move into uh, an adult world, but still without big-name stars, um, in a part of the world unknown to most people, dealing with difficult social issues like um, child exploitation and uh, poverty. It doesn't seem like a winning formula, and yet he manages to craft... Um, a rather wonderful film from that what appears to be unpromising commercial um, combination. So I, I guess it was that, um, if that answers the question. Oh, no. The, um, as for the book itself, uh, what types of things do you get into? It takes a, a, a kind of 
um, not really a thematic approach, but it, it, it deals with all the films um, in a way, film by film, but in a way, um, I tried to organize it slightly differently. Um, I've got, so I've got chapters on um, regional and national identity um, or moral choices. Most of his films deal with some kind of um, ethical dilemma. Um, religion seemed to be important. Um, and also trying to think about genre, because it seemed to me if you if you laid all his DVDs out on the ground and said to people, what do those films have in common? You would be hard-pressed to get many people to even even link them as being made by the same person. They, they, they are so, so different um, from Shallow Grave and Train Spotting, which seem to have something in common, but then Life Less Ordinary um, and things like The Beach, 28 Days Later, Sunshine uh, and Slumdog. They, they seem to be so different generically, um, stylistically, there isn't there isn't a sort of signature Boyle element that you can easily, instantly um, label each one as a, as a typical Boyle product. He's a very, uh, very unpredictable kind of uh, filmmaker, which makes him interesting to me, at least. Um, and he tries to do different things with um, whatever genre he picks. So, uh, I mean, I haven't I, I haven't yet seen his uh, attempt at. Steve Jobs, the Steve Jobs movie is not out here yet. Um, but as a biopic, that doesn't take a, a standard um, chronological view through his life. He's, he's opted for three big scenes, uh, and that's the structure of the film. Whereas someone like Fincher, um, when he did his take on um, technology and the social network, is a, is a much more uh, conventional kind of biopic in a way. It tries to do something dramatic with it, but not, not as... Um, as uh, as different as revolutionary as, as I think Boyle does. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, how did he end up in film? Like Mr. Fincher, I'll try not to talk about Mr. Fincher too much, but they, neither of them went to film school. So Boyle's background is uh, theatre. Um, he was a theatre director of some note, um, helped uh, and worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company, not producing Shakespeare, but he worked with the RSC, um, and a couple of productions, and was head of um, the Royal Court, which is a quite an in, an known for its innovative um, theatrical productions um, in London. So he was um, he worked his way up to be uh, artistic director at the Royal Court. Um, then he worked for the BBC um, and worked with a, a number of quite influential TV directors, not necessarily people who went on to film, uh, but learnt his craft. Um, in the drama department of the BBC, um, and was involved in in a number of productions which perhaps American audiences don't know that well, um, and I'm not even sure if it's available online. But uh, there was a, a drama in '93 called uh, Mr. Rose Virgins with a silent uh, W uh, W R O E, Mr. Rose Virgins, um, set in the the north of England, based around a, a rather strange religious sect. Um, and he he was quite heavily involved in that, which I think was also the first uh, appearance of Minnie Driver. She's in that. Um, but from TV, um, yeah, we have Shallow Grave because that was funded by um, Channel 4, which is a, an innovative TV um, channel. Um, it was. It isn't now. It's, it's kind of like MTV. started out very interesting and innovative and became something rather less pleasant these days. But uh, in those days, it helped fund um, groundbreaking indie film. Um, so most people, most Brits know Shallow Grave as a, as a sort of TV production that they saw in the early 90s, first of all, on the small screen, more than uh, in a cinema. That's interesting, because I think it was a theatrical release here in the States, and then I think I didn't get a chance to see it until after Train Spotting. Yeah, yeah, I think... I think a lot of people experienced it that way around, that train spotting was the first big screen experience of Boyle. And after having seen, you know, Hugh and McGregor run at you in those opening sequences, people went back and thought this is interesting enough to, to find out what else he's done. So you said Channel 4 was involved with Shallow Grave. Uh, do you have any other background into um, how the film came to be, script and production? Well, the script is is by John Hodge, who's a who's a qualified doctor. It's a rather interesting hobby to have, but uh, he uh, he formed something of a partnership with Boyle in these early films, so um, Train Spotting, um, Lifeless Ordinary, and uh, Shallow Grave, all all scripted by him. Um, 
and uh, and also the producer Andrew McDonald, and the three of them with Boyle made a made a sort of partnership, creative partnership in the early part of his career. Um, uh, yeah, I think Channel Four um, helped very much revive the, the British film industry that has had sort of ups and downs much more than than the Hollywood um, side of things. So. He, he, in the early part of his career, Boyle is often seen as a, as a bit of a, of a champion of British cinema. So people often see Train Spotting and Shallow Grave as uh, not either British if you are from south of the border or Scottish if you're Scottish. Um, but I don't think necessarily Boyle sees himself as, as, a, as a, a standard bearer of uh, Britishness. It just, it just is how it happened to uh, develop that way, really. Um, I mean, train spotting and, and shallow grave are, are something of a um, a sort of double pack in a way um, because of, of where they're set. Um, but it's not as if um, Boyle is averse to making films in other places. It, it just so happened that uh, the people he wanted to work with were were based there, and that money could be could be borrowed. Um, and Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, lend themselves to to relatively low budget filmmaking, really. As for the uh, production on that, and you said uh, earlier, this is, I guess I would say probably most folks, at least in the States, uh, introduction to Ewan McGregor. Was this his uh, first work, Shallow Grave? As far as I can remember, yeah. I mean, I wrote this book a while ago, so um, I think it was either it was this or pretty close to this. Um, this was, was would be the first time most people had seen him. Um uh, I, I can't think of anything before this. So short answer, I would think yes. And then, obviously, with the other cast in there, you end up with, uh, in later years, a Doctor Who. Yes, yes. Um, uh, not just there, but also um, he appeared in 28 Days Later as well. Um, and um, uh, Robert Carlyle is also a, an actor that uh, Boyle comes back to in... Um, 28 Days Later, and, and also in, um, um, I'm just trying to think what other film he's been in. He's been in another Boyle film as well. Uh, can't think of it right now. It's gone from my head. But the, the, he, he has worked with a, a few actors, not not in a quite a Wes Anderson kind of way with a, with a, a small cast that he only comes to. But uh, there are certain actors that uh, that he, he uses as a, as a go-to uh, certainly in the early part of his career with Ewan McGregor, that that, that bond was quite strong um, through Shallow Grove, Train Spotting, Life Less Ordinary. And then it went a bit sour um, because Ewan McGregor felt that he was he was promised a part in the beach or the lead in the beach, which ultimately went to Leonardo DiCaprio. As you said, uh, Ewan McGregor was uh, um, said that he was... Uh, to get the lead in the beach, and that led to some bad blood between the pair. Yes, they haven't worked together since then. Um, so that's 1997 with A Life Less Ordinary, and um, Boyle, uh, Ewan McGregor felt that he had been offered, or he understood that he'd been offered the, the main role in the beach, which ultimately went to, to Leonardo DiCaprio, and, and was very unhappy about, about that. Um, and the two haven't worked together this is um, Boyle and McGregor since then, but the next year there is uh, plans afoot to film the sequel to Train Spotting, um, and that McGregor is penciled in as the as the lead for that, so that they will, twenty years later, come to come to hopefully some sort of agreement and work together. Shallow Grave, in terms of production, it was uh, a relatively low budget affair. I think what you see on the screen, most of the cinematic thrills. Um, are, 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 yeah, the, well, there aren't there aren't any major special effects. Nothing too exciting. Nothing too expensive. It, it would be um, really the wages of the the main cast members, um, shooting time. The, you know, there's nothing too massively expensive there. It feels like a piece of theatre, and I think it has been staged. I think as, as theatre, it's small scale, concentrated, um, basically a, a three hander um, between. Two guys and one girl in a in a um, in the townhouse, and uh, that's that's the focus of of uh, the majority of the scenes. There are little scenes outside that, but most of the the action, dramatic action, happens within the flat. And uh, in terms of setups and so on, is is fairly modest. 
but it doesn't feel too low budget. I think that's that's one of the things you 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 do notice if someone says it's a low budget film, it doesn't it doesn't feel too creaky. Um, you know, it, it doesn't rely on cheap effects or um, something to cover that up. Really, I think it, it works on its own terms quite well. In terms of the response uh, when it came out, what was what were the reviews like? What did people think? I think the reviews were reasonably positive, but it, it didn't have a big advertising budget behind it, um, and I think it remained something of a a cult classic. The people who who saw it, the few the few that did, um, it, it did get a theatrical release, but it it wasn't in cinemas very long. Um, because it didn't have this budget behind it, and then the, the people in it were not known as, as major stars at that time. So it, it, it passed through. Um, it allowed Boyle to gather the finance for train spotting, which was also relatively low budget, but that that really burst onto the burst onto the screen and, and made a much bigger impact, um, possibly because of music as much as anything. Train spotting is such a kinetic experience cinematically, and uh, the, the the promotion of film now is so tied up with music that, that it seemed a natural part of that film from the opening with Lust for Life blasting out at you to uh, a lot of the, the dance um, bands that were in there, Underworld and so on, that Boyle really liked and wanted to promote. Um, and that kind of gave the, the Britpop mid-90s um, musical movement quite a, quite a push. So he was... He was kind of riding a, a real crest of a, of, a, of a commercial and musical wave in the mid '90s with train spotting. But Shallow Grave, um, I, I, I remember seeing it early. How early I can't remember, but it, it certainly didn't have particular mass appeal. But it was positive. The, the, the critical reviews were good. For me, it sort of fits in in a particular way in its own unique style to maybe sort of the neo noirs that were coming out in the early and mid '90s. LA Confidential and that kind of thing. Yeah, there was, seemed to be a resurgence in crime film in that era, and and although this is a small scale one, possibly. I mean, the, the, it isn't it isn't really noirish in that many aspects because although it is it is a crime story in in a way, uh, in that there is some money at the beginning and you don't quite know where that's come from, and they are the, the main characters are supposed to hand the money in. Um, it's not as if that's the proceeds from a crime that they have committed. It's uh, it's money that lands in their lap. So it, it feels to me more like a, a dilemma, um, a, a kind of quandary film, what would you do if it happened to you? A bit like in, in Millions, another film that boiled it later that not many people saw, um, which also deals with money landing at the feet of the protagonist and what they do with it. Um, so it's a bit strange. It's, a, it's unusual in that there isn't a crime committed um, initially it's a kind of crime of omission that they don't go to the police and admit they have this money which clearly is not theirs but they didn't steal um, and then there are probably various misdemeanors in terms of disposal of a body they didn't murder this man who died and by which they got the money but they disposed of the body without telling anyone so um, it's not quite a crime noir um, along the lines of um, of other ones in that in that period because you've got figures like Tarantino as well um, doing what he does <laughs> wonderfully well. But Boyle is is, is looking at uh, crime in a more uh, human context, and I think, and also the results of crime rather than the people who perpetrate it. Um, I don't think a crime story is is probably the genre he hasn't really hasn't really covered yet. Perhaps he will. Um, except trauma. Yeah, that would be more of a, a crime story because there, there is a there is a murder uh, and a plan and a uh, and, and his central characters do do actually perpetrate the crime. But here, that they're they're more uh, reacting to what other the crimes of others. Um, there is there is some similarity in that um, the characters are quite cold. Um, the initial. Um, title of the film is going to be Cruel, Cruel, I think. And certainly from the opening, you get the idea that these are particularly sadistic, um, almost psychopathic uh, characters in some way. They, they they seem to lack empathy, which is a, a thing that people tell us psychopaths have or don't have. That uh, that opening scene where they interview people for to be flatmates, um, and they don't really want anybody. They're just they're just there to humiliate them. 
um, that that is in in some ways is more vicious than a than a sort of blood soaked Tarantino shooting. In some ways, it's it's just absolutely brutal uh, and crushing for the the poor people who are sat on the sofa being asked these deliberately humiliating questions. Um, but that's that's in a way sort of a, a British humour element, I think, more than a more than a crime story. It's, it's sort of. Um uh, snarling at people through uh, through a smile, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I mean, the, the, there's quite a, a long speech, I think, by by you and McGregor's character, where he says, "What more or less?" I'm paraphrasing here from memory, but what what makes you think that we would possibly want someone like you? That they they lull these people into a, a full sense of security that they could be welcomed to this wonderful house. It's a very desirable house in a desirable neighbourhood, and. The, uh, you can see the hope in the eyes of these, these poor applicants who are being interviewed for something they really want, and they're being led to believe that it's within their grasp. And then they're, they're hit with this hammer blow that, of course, we don't want you go away. What would make, what possibly would make you think you're suitable for us? <laughs> deeply, deeply unsympathetic characters, um, which is, is quite an achievement in making us want to watch them, cause, because normally if these people on the screen behave quite that badly. You'd, you'd be looking for something to to like in them, um, but you have to look quite hard in Shallow Grave. They, they really are not not likable in any way. Um, possibly you and McGregor character. He's more resourceful and a little more witty and honest. Um, the uh, the David character, Chris Eccleston's character, is uh, dull to start with and has um, kind of hidden depths um, of cruelty as much as anything. Um, and the Kerry Fox character. Um, she's having to be more Machiavellian than at first appears of, of, of seeing who um, who would pursue her interest most of those two male characters and seems without much principle of which she would back. Um, but that, you know, the final twists at the end, um, you end up with, with, with one body on the floor, one girl with the money or so she thinks, but end up with nothing and a wounded Ewan McGregor character but possibly he ends up with the money because he knows it's under the floorboards. Um, just to spoil the story for your listeners, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, if they've listened this far, um, it, we've already told them <laughs> we're going to spoil it. The um, the thing that's that's interesting, and I really didn't think about it this way until um, earlier in the conversation. You were talking about sort of thematic elements that you see in his films, and one of which you say is. Um, I guess sort of a questions of morality uh, throughout the film. So, so do you see that in here, and, and how does that play out? You think throughout his entire catalog of work, like twenty years of work. Well, I don't know if it's if it's deliberate. I think he's drawn to scripts which have which have interesting questions behind them. They're not necessarily front and center, so you don't necessarily, you know, it's not indecent proposal where the the premise is the is the is the dilemma. Um, but basically, Shallow Grave is about a group of characters who have money thrown at them. What do they do with it? Do they go to the police? If they don't go to the police, how do they divide it up? How do they um, mask that newfound wealth? Um, Millions is a, is a more interesting one. It's such a fantastic film. Very. I, I don't know if Millions is known in, in the States at all. Um, do people know that film there? Well, I remember when it came out, but like most people, I guess I didn't get to see it or didn't see it. Yeah. Well, the, the problem with that, from a marketing point of view, is it's described as a children's film. And as soon as you describe something as a children's film, most children's films are t- truly terrible. And they're basically an adult film with all the interesting bits stripped out that you take out sex, violence, you know, rock and roll, anything that's remotely stimulating or interesting or troublesome. And what you're left with is nine times out of ten or even 99 out of 100, something pretty anodyne and, and bland and, and, and uninteresting for kids as well as for adults who have to go go and sit through them in the cinema. Um, but no, Millions is, is a wonderful, wonderful children's film. I urge, I urge anybody who's listening to this to go, go and see it. It's, uh, that, that features a dilemma too of, of the money that's found, but the central character of the children, um, a pair of brothers, the younger of whom is a, a very unusual, slightly eccentric character who um, sees visions. He appears to be able to talk to figures who are saints. He's a Catholic and he has strong religious belief 
and in his daily life from time to time he will have conversations with uh, Francis of Assisi who happens to be um, releasing some doves above where he lives in Liverpool um, where the boy lives, not where the Francis lives um, so the, 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 there are these sort of fantasy sequences which are not signals of fantasy sequences and it really makes you think is the boy deluded, is he mad and you realise by the end of the film that there's a, a situation with grief, that the mother has died and that perhaps this is some coping mechanism or perhaps this, this boy has the ability to see visions, if you believe in Catholicism then miracles are in theory possible you have saints uh, and perhaps he is he is one of those, um, but it's it, it's also kind of brutally realistic. These these visions are not signalled by strange music and a wobbly screen. You get none of that fictive uh, markers that tell you you're watching a vision. It's 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 strictly uh, shot in a realistic sense. Um, so you have you have a sort of religious questions. Um, because the boy believes this is a gift from God, what would you do with millions and millions of pounds? Because it is pounds um, that will soon become uh, valueless because the country is going to switch to euros. Um, and he wants to do the right thing. He wants to do good. And how how can an eleven year old with suddenly millions of pounds do something that is that, that God would want you to do? Um, it's quite a profound sort of central part of a kid's film. You know, I can't think of another example that, that does that as well. So um, you have films like that, and then Sunshine, where you're uh, part of a crew trying to reanimate the sun, because without it, um, humankind is doomed. And at some point in the um, mission, you realize that you're not going to make it back. Do you sacrifice yourself to... Um, save your species you know, how how much of a cosmo, uh, cosmic hero are you um, and most of the films have that kind of element in them they're not always um, sat around and discussed they are a bit in millions but there's there's often that kind of uh, moral dilemma you have it in train spotting too how does Renton get out of that situation well the only way he can is by physically leaving you know he, he cannot he leaves once to go to London but his friends, so-called, follow him there. It's only by running away, but also by stealing the money that they've managed to get in a, in a last gasp drug deal. Um, it's only by getting physically away from them that he has a, has a chance. But would you betray your friends to have a sort of hope, uh, a shot at personal redemption? Um, I think Boyle was very big on redemption. There are not many films that don't have uh, some kind of potential hope. Is, would you say that that's sort of his central theme, the central ideas that he keeps coming back to, or are there other things that you also see in his films that he, ideas, themes he keeps returning to? That's much harder, because I think a lot of other filmmakers do have preoccupations. Um, I wouldn't say it's easy to pinpoint that many. I mean, he's interested in people, he's interested in conflict, he's interested in small, uh, he's cast off in small um it sounds a bit stereotypical of, of any interesting drama, but a small group of people who are put under stress. Um, but it, it's more the human interaction of that small group um, in, a, in a given situation. You know, he doesn't he doesn't make that many films. He's not quite a kind of Kubrick with five years between, but he takes quite a while to choose um, the next project. He only works with writers he really, really trusts. Um, he doesn't really feel drawn to generic pieces um, although he, he adds to genres he doesn't I can't think of a film that he's sort of worked so within generic parameters you can even say it's a that kind of film even 28 Days Later which is often misdescribed as a as a zombie film it isn't really that at all um, they happen to be they happen to be these yeah, unpleasant creatures that try and try and kill you but they, they are not zombies they're far from it um, so it would be hard, actually. I mean, the book, I read, it, it doesn't deal necessarily in a thematic way. I think books that try and do that often do films quite a, a disservice because they they look for something and then they keep finding what they're looking for rather than looking at the film as it is and what that offers. Um, because I think a more um, useful way of looking at, uh, at film generally. Um, I, I mean, he's interested in, in um, people who have 
some redemptive quality. There's, there's got to be something which gives hope, I think, by the by the end. Um, so that, for example, millions... Um, oh, I shouldn't spoil that one if people haven't seen that. But there is a, there is a positive image at the end of that. Um, shallow grave, although ending with two out of the three um, people, one dead, one disappointed, one stabbed and pinned to the floor, um, still has the opportunity to redeem himself and, and, and be successful with the money he knows lies under the boards. Um, in train spotting, venting um, escapes. Um, there, there is a, a sort of romantic uh, conclusion to a life less ordinary. Um, the beach has the Leonardo DiCaprio character survive. Uh, I'm just destroying all the endings for people, aren't I? <laughs> um, but it, it seems that, that um, characters are put under great stress. There is evil. People suffer. Uh, characters die for no reason uh, of their own making. Um, so the mother in Slumdog, for example, is, is killed when she has done nothing wrong. <laughs> but um, through a character's own efforts, it is possible to have some degree of um, reconciliation and hope and, and, and some sort of redemption. You also mentioned in the book you sort of look at um, ideas of regionalism, and especially with uh, Shallow Grave and Train Spotting, um, sort of looking at uh, sort of, I guess, uh, the, the setting in Scotland. What does what do those films have to say back and forth on that kind of issue? Well, as I mentioned, that um, Shallow Grave uh, clearly, although it is set in Scotland, and the the, uh, the, the central characters, um, two or th- two out of the three at least, can do a a good Scottish accent. Um, you have a Scottish setting. The Scottish setting is, is emphasised right from the, the the outset when you you kind of race through the the streets of Edinburgh right to this, this the door of this house where most of the action takes place. Um, train spotting is is more a, a, a consideration of that because you have a um, a greater number of Scottish either actors or people who are have some Gaelic link with with either the north of England like Chris Eccleston or who are um, uh, believable as, as Scott, sorry, Chris Eccleston's not in that, but there are other ensemble characters who, who can do a, uh, who have a credible um, Scottish persona, and they, they also do deal with um, questions of, of uh, national identity. There are scenes such as where um, the, the, the group of characters that Renton uh, is a part, they, they, go, they go to the countryside fantastic thing where they get off at this uh, railway station in the middle of nowhere and they're, they're, they're kind of just looking around at, uh, at nothing, these rolling hills which in, I don't know, even films like Skyfall or um, you know, ever since Brigadoon the Scottish landscape has uh, been seen as, as, as a source of national pride and inspiration and at the same time, more or less, the train spotting was coming out, you had Braveheart and uh, Rob Roy um, stoking up these feelings of Scottish nationalism and, and pride, and in train spotting, in in that scene where they get off the train, um, all of them are just absolutely um, embarrassed and sick of being Scottish. Um, most of all, because they've been colonised by the English, and for them, there's nothing worse. So they, they, instead of feeling a sense of national pride, they feel almost shame for being Scottish and for their history of um, being exploited by the English. Um, so it's, it's, it's a deliberate attempt on the part of Boyle not to play the kind of nationalist card with all the, the iconography of bagpipes and tartan. Um, there's a tiny little scene where you have some American tourists who go into a pub and ask for directions, I think, to the Edinburgh Festival. Um, and it's a sort of little throwaway scene of about 30 seconds, but basically they, they're beaten up in the toilets for uh, daring to come to that part of Scotland and be different. Or you know, it's also an attack on on the commercialisation of Scottish culture um, that uh, the Edinburgh Festival sometimes seems to be. I think uh, to, it's, it's it's grown out of all proportion, and it's uh, like a lot of festivals these days, more driven by commercial concerns than um, deriving from the culture. In your research for the book, did you get a chance to interview with Danny Boyle or any of his uh, people that he'd worked with over the years? Um, I did approach him. I'm, I'm speaking to you now from Germany, so I, I, my, my circumstances are a little more complicated than when I was in Britain. Um, 
he was quite friendly, but didn't didn't really want to, not that he didn't want to speak to me, but he would uh, he didn't really want to analyse his own work. He's quite careful about that. Um, there's a few things that he does that are really quite interesting about um, uh, in his interaction with the media. Um, for example, when he when he has these kind of big press junkets and has to answer the same questions over and over, little things like. Um, when he has one interview after another, he will switch seats or he'll move a little bit so that it it feels to him like a, a fresh performance or a fresh conversation. Um, little theatrical tricks like that um, that he does to try and stop his um, responses from appearing stale. But he, when he has been interviewed and asked these sorts of questions, he's quite reluctant to be too analytical of his own thinking and his own processes. He wants to try at least and retain a certain innocence which you know, it's almost impossible um but he's he doesn't do big sit down interviews um and he's it may be just because he doesn't have to um but my impression is that he doesn't really want to spoil and, and sort of codify or rationalize something which he feels is quite organic and creative it sounds a bit well a bit theatrical really um, in a way, but he was he was quite friendly. I did ask, um, and he wished me all the best with it, but gave me a, a polite no. Is that also the same with? Um, and I know that there are some directors who don't do these either. Him doing uh, any sort of commentary tracks on films. Yes, yes, that's that's true. Um, it depends on the film. Um, um, you know, David Fincher won't do anything on Alien Three because it's a an interesting mess of a film. I think it's a really, really underrated, interesting mess. But uh, it's it's not his mess, really. I don't think he can. He feels he can take responsibility. But generally, yes, there are there are some um, commentators who are who are more than happy to t- give you a, a shot by shot, blow by blow account, and others who really don't want to do it um, for a similar reason. I think they. they 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 don't want to kind of spoil the magic of the of the moment. It depends how um, technical based they are, how driven they are by setups rather than by um, an element of spontaneity in performance. And I think Boyle is very much um, one of the directors who is interested in a a limited number of takes uh, and capturing something in that moment that can only be created in that moment. Um, which is why I think he likes working with children. Um, Finch has never worked with children, doesn't like working with non-professionals, and I, I can understand that. Um, but that level of control that someone like Finch wants, you just can't, you can't always have. Whereas Boyle tends to embrace the, the spontaneity and, um, well, the, the, the unpredictability of working with people who are not professionals and, uh, and including children um, and low budgets and. Uh, not having post-production, he doesn't do very much at all in terms of post-production. Most of the effects, if they are effects, happen in real time in front of the camera. You had already mentioned Millions, but uh, what is one of your favorite films of his that uh, you think has been overlooked or people don't give enough respect to? And they should go back and look at it again. Difficult for me to say for American views because I'm, you know, over here in Europe. Um, I don't know. I don't know how Slumdog is, really, is, is sort of viewed over there. If, if people know that. Is Slumdog a, a well-known film over there? Well, I'd say when it came out. I think by now it's probably like you'd have to reintroduce it to people because they'd probably have forgotten about it by now, even though it did win all the awards and got a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean, 28 Days Later is a, is a slow burn um, success. I mean, there are there are so many horror films being made, um, and that is one of the few Boyle films that tends to get put in a particular generic category. Um, but I think people who people who like horror film and know horror film know Twenty Eight Days Later, and um, I'm not sure that there is a there's a sort of un, unrecognized masterpiece. Shallow Grave certainly doesn't doesn't get its share of viewers, and people should. But uh, to answer your question, um, I'm not sure that there is an obvious candidate for for a neglected Boyle film. Um, 127 Hours. Um, people might not even have associated that with with Danny Boyle, um, and, and I think that's quite a hard sell once you know <laughs> what it's about. You know, the guy who traps his arm under a boulder and has to cut off his own arm in order to escape. 
that's not necessarily going to draw that many people with that kind of a premise. It's uh, quite an ambitious, hard sell. Um, a life less ordinary. I think maybe that is, is... Do people know that in the States? I, I saw it in the theatre when it came out. The life, a life less ordinary is a bit of a, an unusual mix of... Uh, an attempt at, at, a, at a screwball comedy, and you don't you don't have screwball comedies anymore. And from time to time, people try and try and make them, and sometimes they work, oftentimes they don't. And it's a bit like um, the Cohen brothers' Burn After Reading. Um, it, there's a sort of mixture of tones in um, A Life Less Ordinary, some of which work and some of which don't. There's quite an interesting premise of. It starts with some angels, uh, modern-day angels, who try and examine whether true love is still possible in the, the cynical world in which we live. Um, but other uh, other parts of it, um, it sort of works in fits and starts. There's, there's, there's some witty banter between uh, Cameron Diaz and, and Ewan McGregor's character. Um, he kidnaps her. She's a daughter of man. Um, and he's a hopeless kidnapper. Uh, she She is much more worldly than he is. So there's, there's there's some comic banter there. There's a, a sort of battle between the sexes, which you also have in Screwball. Um, you have some inversion of class um, and some questioning of, of where people are in society. But it, it doesn't really work on those terms. It's talking about a genre that most people don't know. You know, people like me might tell you it's a, supposed to be a Screwball comedy, but that's not a, a sort of live genre. It, it pops up from time to time, makes me think of that uh, lovely Madonna film, Who's That Girl? Um, but it doesn't necessarily um, sort of rate as, as, as a genre that people know. So if someone tries to do a, an updated version of it, even though they try really hard, um, I think a lot of cinema guys wouldn't know or wouldn't notice if it was successful, successful or not. I was going to ask, what's, where's the best place for people to get your book? It's on Amazon, I believe. All good bookstores, possibly some bad ones. Um, it's a it's a physical copy, so uh, I guess any any Barnes and Noble, if you still have them in your area. And also, is there anywhere online where people can keep up with you as an author and um, see the latest work you've been working on? Well, yes and no. Mainly no. Um, this is not part of your interview, but I, I I write fiction as well, but I write fiction under a different name, which. Uh, Nobody knows. Only four people in the world know I do this other other thing. So I, I don't link my film work with my fiction work. So I'm I'm writing fiction, and that um, is a is a, has a has websites and, and things like this. But as a um, as a film writer, no, I, I don't have a website. But I, I am on. A, if you Google Mark Browning, you can find the other uh, six books that I have. A couple of adaptations on um, Stephen King work. So if you're interested in that that might be something for you as well. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time. Okay. I hope that was uh, of, of use and of interest to somebody. Thanks to Mark Browning for joining us. You can get more on his work and pick up the book on our website at projection-booth.com. So we're back. We're talking about Shallow Grave and Gentlemen. We now come to the time where is there uh, anything else left to add? Hmm. Recommendation? Oh, I highly recommend this film. If you haven't seen Shallow Grave, God help you. I'm sorry that you've listened this far in the podcast and uh, had everything absolutely spoiled for you. But uh, if you made it this far and you haven't seen the movie, you need to uh, check it out like right now. I agree. I mean, it's a, it's, uh, if you like Danny Boyle's films, you're going to like this. Um, and I think it's cool to see, you can see kind of the, you know, the early g- genetics of his filmmaking there and how they carry over in other films. And also how it became a, a launching point for some really talented people, for Ewan McGregor, for Christopher Eccleston, um, even for Brian Chifano, the cinematographer. He had done Quadrophenia. Um, but then the only other thing he had done before Shallow Grave was, you know, this cheesy movie from Hollywood called Dreamscape. Um, and oh, which I love. Yeah, it, 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 it's a guilty pleasure of mine, too. Yeah. But, um, 
but then he got to work. He he did you know another three projects with uh, Danny Boyle. He did Train Spotting. He did A Life Less Ordinary, and he did a film I'd never have gotten to see by uh, Boyle called Alien Love Triangle that he did that was supposedly for an anthology that never came about. Um, he also shot the movie Billy Elliot. So I mean he, he he's a, he's a really talented cinematographer who and I think you I think Shallow Grave and Danny Boyle gave him an opportunity to show how good he could be because the 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 uh the image work in that film is just gorgeous and especially when you consider it was a you know it was a fairly low built budget film it was shot for a million pounds which you know at the time was a very still considered a very indie level budget um and then of course it went on to make whatever 20 million or so worldwide um so yeah, I definitely recommend it. I think it's a great film. Uh, the uh, you said if there's anything I can add, I looked up. I found a little bit of trivia. I found out that the shots with the money in the film, they actually they're real money, and they hire they they rented a million quid for one day just to get those shots. Huh. I don't know how you rent a million quid, but they did it. <laughs> so. We rented a million pounds. <laughs> how I much mean, did it cost you a million pounds <laughs> well they must have had like some insurance it must have been you know some through, through some insurance or something i don't know as long as you don't return it with any blood on it or stage blood you'll be okay right <laughs> <laughs> or it'll be on one 20 pound note and and we'll 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 replace that one right <laughs> very nice all right we are going to take our final break and play a preview for next week's show this is the dawning of the Age of Colossus. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Charles Foreman. In a few moments, Colossus will address us directly. This is the voice of world control. I bring you peace. It may be the peace of plenty and content, or the peace of unburied death. The choice is yours. Obey me and live. Or disobey and die. The frightening story of the day man built himself out of existence. Colossus, the Forbin Project. It's making you a prisoner. Shock, horror, suspense. Created with all the technological brilliance of 2001, a space odyssey. Colossus is the ultimate in sophisticated computers. I'm going to try to convince the computer that you're my mistress. And that therefore I have to be given the opportunity to see you regularly in private. That way we can pass information back and forth. Four times a week. When do you think you'll be able to attempt the overload? Colossus sees all, senses all, knows all, controls all armaments and all defenses. When this emotionless creation becomes the master of man, the result is catastrophic. The Supreme Council of the USSR has ordered as of 2300 hours Moscow time tomorrow. The activation of an electronic brain, exactly like ours, which they call God. They built Colossus, supercomputer with a mind of its own. Then they had to fight it for the world. The missile has just been launched. It is heading towards the Sayan Sibiesk oil complex. Guardian has retaliated. Retaliated? It may be too late, sir. Oh, my God. Right next week, it's computers trying to run the world. Um, don't they know that's our job? We dive into Colossus, the Forbin Project. Don't miss it. But before we run, we want to thank this week's special guests, screenwriter John Hodge and author Mark Browning for taking the time. And also, great to have back special guest co-host this week, Jeff Myers. Jeff, what's the latest with you, sir? Uh, well, I'm still writing for Movie Maker, and... Um 
you know, I've got projects of my own and making short films and uh, trying to make that transition from being a former film critic to a filmmaker. It's never happened before. Don't even right. try it. That, ne- never. That true foe guy, forget it. Um, <laughs> as for you, you just had one that uh, has been out on the festival circuit and done quite well. Yeah, I have a short film called uh, The Blood of Love, and it's played in about 35 festivals so far. and It's won a few awards, and it's gotten me a few interviews, and we'll see. Hopefully hopefully something will come of it, and I wouldn't, will not have thrown all that money down the, down the short film hole for nothing. <laughs> well, don't you know you can just do like a six-second video and put it on YouTube, and then you can be a YouTube star? Isn't that what the future is? Not making those weird old films? Yeah, if only if only I'd, I'd been smart enough to make a lot of vines. <laughs> Maybe, uh, <laughs> there's my future. <laughs> Those kids today with with their vines. I'm telling you, that's probably outdated by now. I'm just waiting for vine to be a euphemism for something. <laughs> vine me. <laughs> vine me. There you go. <laughs> vine Mar Cinema. What? Brunz. Yes. Yes, yes. Thanks so much for having me, though. It's been awesome. I always love doing these. I love the the whole deep dive approach, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I hope it's as fun for people to listen to as it is to do it. Well, my mom loves it, and uh, that's that's all that's all you need, right? Is this your mom to listen, and everything's good? No, I'm just kidding. My mom just listens to the show. <laughs> yeah, my, my mom gave up. She said that that Conan episode was way too long. So. <laughs> No, actually, I thought she said it wasn't long enough. She said something about crushing her enemies. I'm not sure how it went. Something about being drawn before them and their women will scream or cry or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. So, Rob, you want to talk about what you'll be doing from here on out for the next uh, two and a half months? Yeah, I've been hired as a mercenary, and um, I'm going to an undisclosed location, and I can't talk about it. All right. I guess no. that's all we'll say. No. Um, I'm taking a break. Uh, I've got a lot going on. And uh, not that I don't love uh, Mr. Mike White and talking to you folks each week, because I do. But um, to be honest, I don't feel like I'm meeting the the standards at which I set for myself, because I'm too busy. And I need to get my life in order, and then I will come back and be able to give the show what I feel it rightfully deserves. So, um if you miss me, I say thank you. Uh, but there are lots of great guest hosts that will be coming on over the next several weeks, and they will be uh, guiding you through, and then I'm hoping to return in February. Listen, the word's too fucking busy. You shouldn't be in a vocabulary of a podcaster. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> those, those podcasters uh, don't like to, uh, you know... I guess those podcasters have not a problem living in their car and, and things like that. So I, you know, I've, there's a certain level of life that I've become accustomed to living. And uh, in order to make that happen, I have to stay extremely busy. Well, thank you once again to everybody who's been involved with this podcast. Thank you for listening. And we will uh, hope that you consider going over to our website, projection-boot.com, taking the time to leave us some feedback. Go run over to iTunes, leave us a review, donate some of that hard-earned cash. Uh, if you expect me to help out with the rent, you're in for a big surprise. But just go on over to our Patreon, or if you want, just come on by the website and say hello, projection com. It's just a few more ways that you can help us take over the world.
to love and to happiness forever. Forever and ever. What's wrong? I want to talk now. Not until you've drunk to love and happiness forever. Now. After. David, I promise we will just keep them happy. It's not for me. It's for love and happiness forever. If you enjoy this show and want more people to know about it, head on over to iTunes, leave a comment, and rate it five stars. Make sure you like and share us on Facebook, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Just search for Christopher Media. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Most importantly, we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you. Christopher Media could not exist without your support. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net, and thank you for listening. Christopher Media. Let's make some noise.